and it has been uh, uh, implemented. So in recognizing his uh, research work and his, uh, because of, to give honor to him, today uh, we thought on his uh, birthday, we are having a webinar on diabetes in pregnancy. So I welcome you all for this webinar on, well, on diabetes in pregnancy. Over to Dr. Dana. Yeah, on this day, uh, I am uh, wishing to share a, a small slogan sent by Dr. Sambath Kumari. I pledge to prevent diabetes. This uh, uh, I pledge to the Diabetes Society from each and every member of uh, OXI. On uh, OXI's behalf, I just extend this pledge to uh, prevent diabetes on this particular day, where GDM Awareness Day is uh, to be conducted on 10th March. And think nutrition first. And uh, we have a special online CME on uh, diabetes mellitus and pregnancy today. And uh, this is how the agenda goes. We'll start with the welcome address, uh, which has been given by Madam. And uh, we'll shortly go in for. Uh, I am happy to introduce our president, Dr. Brahm Latha, consultant head of uh, academics department of ONG, Methods Hospital. She's the president uh, of the current. Uh, uh, Oxy team uh, 2022, former director in charge and uh, former professor of MMC, president papers and national and international uh, conferences, expertise in uh, tubal microsurgery and recipient of lifetime achievement award by Dr. MJ Medical University in the year 2012. <laughs> Sikala. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I am happy to introduce our uh, joint secretary, Dr. Kundil Shankar, who will be rendering the Oxy prayer. And uh, she is a leading consultant uh, for court lead in IRM Triple M. She is a renowned, I mean, renowned uh, National Board Certified Obstetrician Gynecologist, specialist in reproductive medicine, laparoscopic surgeon for more than 20 years. She is an active member of Oxy, Oxy, IME, ISAR, and TAPISAR, honorary treasurer for TAPISAR as well. And uh, she is a coordinator for National Board and Triple M Fellowship. Uh, at IRM Triple M and uh, Chairman Anti-Sexual Harassment Committee at Triple M and uh, she's got various publications, reputed journals. She's invited faculty at all the conferences. I invite her to render the Oxy prayer. Thank you, Dana, ma'am, for the introduction. Thank you, God. In humility, we gather. In gratitude, we pay for things. You have given us all the good. Shower us with your blessings to pass on the healing touch and to celebrate the arrival of each new life and a mom reborn. The courage to deal with it all when things are not perfect. To remember that we are on the messengers to keep our women safe and free from sorrow. We bow before your kindness and the magnanimity of your endless love. On behalf of Oxy, we, uh, uh, we wish uh, Sashia, Dr. Professor Sashia for many more happy returns of the day. 
I request the President, Madam, to introduce the Chairperson for this session. Uh, Premlata, Madam. Uh, Dr. Rajpri Ayyapin, she is Secretary Indian Fertility Society of Tamil Nadu Chapter. She is Executive Committee Member of uh, OXI and also ATN RCOJ and FPSI. Foxy Endometrios Committee Member, Secretary for Paramur IMA Women's Wing and uh, Best Doctor Award uh, for IMA 2018, Managing Director of Srinivas Priya Hospital, Perambu, and the Home Fertility Center. Dr. Rajpriya Ayyapin, over to you. Is she available? Rajapriya? Rajapriya? I don't see her face here. Yeah, that's what I'm also not able to see. Dadap oh. Um, Premlata, madam, you can uh, keep introducing the first yeah, speaker. I'll introduce uh, the next speaker. So I'll just introduce uh, the first spe speaker for the day today, Dr. Sunita Prabaharan. She's a director of Sumadhi Hospitals and Fertility Center, Madurai. She has done her MBBS from Madurai Medical College and MD from IOG. She's trained in laparoscopy, hysteroscopy, ultrasonogram, and clinical embryology from premier institutes in India and Cleveland, USA. Uh, she's practiced obstetric gynecologist and fertility consultant since 2007. She has conducted and lectured in multiple workshops. Uh, in order to add one more thing, she's the daughter of Dr. Manorama Madam, who was my teacher in Madre Medical College. Over to Dr. Sunita. I ask, uh, I invite you to talk on screening for diabetes in pregnancy. Thank you, Madam. Uh, very good afternoon to the esteemed office bearers of OXI and respected chairpersons. It's uh, an honor for me to be here today in front of uh, my teachers, Premlata Madam, Anjalakshi Madam. So I'll uh, just start the screen sharing. So uh, my topic for the day is screening for gestational diabetes. To understand how important gestational diabetes is, I will just touch on two things before I move to the actual screening. One is the link between gestational diabetes and type 2 diabetes mellitus. And the second is the huge burden of diabetes and gestational diabetes, which we have in India. Once we understand this, it's easy to see why when we aggressively screen and treat women with diabetes, especially gestational diabetes, we take a huge epidemiological step in preventing and or at least reducing the burden of type 2 diabetes in India. Now, type 2 diabetes, we know, has achieved epidemic proportions, and one-fourth of the global, global burden of type 2 diabetes is borne by seven Southeast Asian countries, the four main ones being India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka. And if this current trend continues, by 2045, 114 million Indians are, will, are predicted to be affected by diabetes, and we will overtake China as the diabetic capital of the world. Recently, we've already overtaken China in being the most populous country in the world. So now there is abundant epidemiological evidence to show that the prevalence of GDM parallels the prevalence of uh, type 2 diabetes. And in fact, gestational diabetes is a marker for type 2 diabetes mellitus. And seeing that it affects women who form about 50% of the population, it's easy to see that uh, now younger women are affected, who are affected by hyperglycemia and pregnancy, the HIP as we call it now, I get type 2 diabetes at a much younger age than they used to before. So the aim is by targeting these women who do get gestational diabetes, we not only reduce the risk for that particular woman and her baby during that index pregnancy, but we are in fact trying to reduce the burden of type 2 diabetes in our country, which as you can see is huge. Um, when we come to the prevalence of uh, diabetes and gestational diabetes in India, there is a great heterogeneity in prevalence. Our country is, has a vast population, uh, which is also very diverse. So in various studies, we can see that the prevalence of uh, diabetes and gestational diabetes can be quoted as low as 3.8% in Kashmir to as high as 35% in Punjab. In um, study. Um, can you move so, it, put your slides on slideshow and move it, madam? We are still in the first slide. Oh. My it's moving for me, madam. Just just one second, madam. I'll stop yeah. it and start it again. So you just put it on slideshow. Yeah, it's on slideshow for me. 
Okay. Can you see it now, madam? I don't know. I, I'll find it from others. Uh, Chitra Kala, is it movie for you? No, ma'am. Make it uh, full screen, ma'am. Yeah, it is full screen. Ma'am, yeah. but for us, it is not full on full screen mode. Uh, yeah. This uh, well, uh, topmost uh, slideshow stuff, madam. Sometimes that works. Ma'am, you can stop share and start re uh, share. Yeah, wait, I just stop it and then okay. I will share it again. You can see it now? Yes, yeah, ma'am. It's, it's moving? Yes, it ma'am. Now perfect, ma'am. Okay. Yeah, it's not moving for me. Yeah, can you see it now? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Moving? Yes, ma'am. It's moving now. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry for that. Uh, so, uh, I was just mentioning that uh, one-fourth of the global burden of type 2 diabetes is borne by the seven main Southeast Asian countries, the main of which being India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka. And if this trend continues, by 2045, 114 million Indians will be affected by diabetes, and we will overtake the China as the diabetic capital of the world. And by screening these women with GDM who are at a much higher risk for getting type 2 diabetes, we are actually not only trying to protect that woman and her baby from the complications of GDM, but we are also trying to prevent the burden of type 2 diabetes in India. So there's a great heterogeneity in the prevalence of diabetes and gestational diabetes in India because we have a very large population. There is a great heterogeneity based on different cultural ethnic factors, the differences screening tests used in different parts of the country. And even if the same screening test is used, the different cutoff values which are taken and where this uh, screening takes place, whether it is in a rural PHC or in a government hospital or in a private resource setting. That's why these authors who publish these studies saying that the prevalence of uh, gestational diabetes is 3.8% in Kashmir and 35% in Punjab. They cite this difference in diagnostic criteria as the reason for this. Now, in 2020, a study was published by Swaminathan et al. in JAMA. And this, they studied a cohort of almost 31,000 women. They took data from the Ministry of Family Welfare archives and they took only two criteria so that it is uniform throughout the country. They took two criteria. One, the fasting sugar value of greater than or equal to 92, or a random sugar value of more than 200. And based on this, they studied the demographic and socioeconomic factors which affect the prevalence of diabetes. And they said they found that the prevalence depends on the age of a woman, BMI of more than 27, which state she resides in, which caste she belongs to, what is her household wealth, what is her family history, and so on. So in one way, they were able to show that bringing a uniform criteria could actually give us be much better data. The two criteria they chose were not accepted by any international society in the world. So the second point they brought out was that a single one size fits all approach may not be applicable in our country because just because of its vast population and diversity. We can easily see that when we have 25 million live births a year in our country, about 5 to 8 million of these live births are affected by gestational diabetes. That is almost one third to one fourth of the births in India are affected by gestational diabetes. The International Diabetic Federation predicts that one in four live births is in women with hyperglycemia and pregnancy in Southeast Asian countries as versus one in six in Western countries. So, even at a glance, even despite so much confusion on prevalence, we can see that our prevalence is much higher and our disease burden is much more. So coming to the uh, history of diabetic screening, diabetic screening, especially for gestational diabetics, was uh, chaotic and unorganized in the beginning. In 1979, USA, the National Diabetic Data Group, were among the earliest to formulate guidelines for the screening of gestational diabetes. And this was followed by the uh, obstetricians in US. After that, a series of conferences were held from 1979 to 1997. Four international conferences were held, and these guidelines were modified and updated according to upcoming research. Now, following this, other countries, the NICE guidelines in UK, 
the Australian Diabetic in Pregnancy Society, the Canadian Diabetic Association, and WHO itself formulated four guidelines in 1980, 85, 99, and 2009 to 13, constantly updating and revising the guidelines as per the data available. In 2010, the International Association of uh, Diabetic Pregnancy Study Group proposed this two-hour test and uh, this is the test which is most commonly followed all over the world. They proposed that a fasting blood sugar followed by a 75 gram glucose load to a pregnant mother on fasting and a one hour and two hour values should be taken and this should be used as a screening test. This is followed by most associations and most uh, countries. However, the guideline, the value which they actually follow at one hour and two hour still varies. Now in India, it was the same thing. Uh, the implementation of a single screening protocol was so difficult because of the population, varying guidelines, the healthcare setting. In a primary health center in the 1990s, only urine sugar and capillary blood glucose would have been available. Whereas uh, in a private hospital setup, they were doing the recommended, the then recommended two-step oral glucose challenge test. That is 50 gram of glucose would be given after one hour a value of more than or greater than or more than 140 was taken as positive and then this woman would be subjected to a second step that is a 100 gram glucose load and a three hour extended glucose tolerance test or in some places the 75 gram glucose load followed by two values at one hour and two hours were followed so there was a great confusion but over the years, with different societies holding different international conferences, some amount of consensus has been reached. And in late, uh, and uh, as uh, Premlata Madam mentioned, it was Dr. Seshaya who introduced the one-step screening test when he published his paper. He said that irrespective of a woman's meal status, 75 gram glucose given to a woman and a single value taken after two hours, if the value is more than or equal to 140, it could be taken as diagnostic of diabetes. This was very useful because in India, it was very difficult to bring back the women for a second test. When the OGCT was found to be positive, it was difficult to call them for a three hour test. There was a difficulty, the cultural difficulty of making a pregnant woman wait in a fasting state to collect her blood test. And even then, when we were giving a oral GTT for three hours, mostly the mother would disappear after the first hour or second hour. So this test was easy, it was economically feasible and the diagnosis could be obtained that day and the patient could be referred to the concern center for further management. So with the world evolution in screening protocols, the screening protocols in India have also evolved. In fact, the DIPSI, the diabetic, uh, Diabetes uh, Study Group in India, this Dr. Sheshia was the main member of this group. They proposed even in 2006 that the single step screening protocol should be applied for diagnosis of gestational diabetes. And we have been doing it since then. However, a technical assistance group, a TAG was formed this were constituted members from FOGSI and FIGO. And in collaboration the, with them, the Government of India, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare issued two sets of guidelines, one in 2014 and one in 2018. They are more or less similar, except that the 2018 guidelines have been updated, keeping in mind that uh, venous plasma testing cannot be available at all rural areas. They validated the use of glucometers for the screening procedure and also the use of oral hypoglycemic agents like metformin in treatment of diabetes. These two are the main differences. The test remains the same in both the guidelines. So who was to be tested? The government of India, uh, in association with FIGO and FOXY, advises universal screening to be performed, seeing that Asian women, every one in 11 women are prone for gestational diabetes. As as to when they should be screened, the earlier uh, protocol we for, used to follow was uh, uh, between 24 to 28 weeks. This was based on the WHO guidelines. However, now at the first visit, whenever the woman comes, we are supposed to screen her for diabetes, giving her this DIPSI test. And if she screens negative, even if she screens negative, this test was to be repeated at 24 to 28 weeks. And the DIPSI test is, as I mentioned before, this is the test they have advised for diagnosis. It's a single step testing. We use 75 grams of oral glucose mixed in 300 ml of water. The solution is to be consumed within five to 10 minutes. And we measure a single blood sugar two hours after ingestion, irrespective of the last meal. Now the DIPSI recommendation was that this should be 
or the venous plasma should be taken. However, considering the large um, reach that this could not have in rural areas, trained lab technicians or facilities for venous glucose extraction could not be made available. The uh, Ministry of Fam Health and Family Welfare have uh, validated the use of a standardized glucometer to evaluate this blood sugar. Now, if vomiting occurs, then it has to be repeated if it is within 30 minutes. If it is after 30 minutes, the test can still be continued. More than or equal to 140 is considered as diagnostic of GDM. There have been several criticisms to the use of uh, this DIPSI method. The hyperglycemia associated pregnancy outcome HAPO study was one of them. This uh, argued that the isolated fasting hyperglycemia was associated with several poor prognostic maternal and fetal outcomes like preterm labor, fetal hyperglycemia, need for neonatal intensive care, and so on. And that by doing a DIPSI test and not screening the fasting blood sugar, we would completely miss this category of women. Two other studies have validated this, that uh, when DIPSI was done on a group of women, and then uh, the International Association of Diabetic Pregnancy Study Group Protocols, that is the 75 fasting one hour, two hour were compared. 22 women with GDM were missed in the DIPSI testing. This was a small study. Uh, it involved only about 150 women. But because IADPGSG protocols were followed worldwide, this test was the study was taken into significance. Another study involving 936 women tested uh, using DIPSI on one day and three days later repeated the same group of women with IADPSG protocols. And this also found that 16% of women who were screened with DIPSI were missed in the well, well tested three days later. So the general conclusion was the sensitivity of DIPSI testing was poor, but the specificity was good. That is, as a screening test, it tended to miss cases, but the specificity was good, which meant it could, could be used as a test for diagnosis and not just screening. But in our country, low middle income group countries, as we've seen, there are so many uh, economic restraints and the diversity and the reach has to be there. So this single step test still remains a very feasible test for our population. Now, if we screen, see the diabetic screening during pandemic times, many countries, because this involved a fasting one hour and two hour test, and this uh, involved the risk of COVID, it seems they switched to testing either one single fasting level or a HbA1c level to estimate the prevalence to, to diagnose gestational mellitus, I mean, to diagnose GDM. Whereas in our country, because it involved only a single stage procedure, the glucose load was given and then with a glucometer, they could test it even elsewhere. So our uh, GDM screening was not very much affected by the pandemic. So uh, this is the screening protocols. I hope uh, I've made it clear about the importance. Luckily, FIGO, FOGSI, DIPSI, they've all uh, uh, gone a great way in educating and reaching the corners of our country so that even in primary health centers, people are now aware of how important it is to screen all women. And a health survey in 2017 also showed that 99% uh, of doctors are now aware of how important it is, and they do offer it to all pregnant women the minute they see them. Thank you, madam, for your opportunity. Thank you, Sunita, for the wonderful presentation on screening for uh, diabetes in pregnancy. You nicely brought about, about the single step procedure and compared their studies, I mean, other comparative studies, and saying that the sensitivity is poor, but specificity is good. So anyway, we are all following the uh, National Health Mission has uh, instructed everybody to follow only the one uh, single step procedure and we are doing it in all institutions. Thank you, doctor. Uh, now, I think we can go with the next uh, speech, uh, nutrition in diabetic mothers. Can I have the CV of uh, Shiny Chandra, please? It's a big... Uh... Shiny Chandran. I mean, uh, I mean uh, Shiny Surendran, actually, I know her right from as a child. Actually, she's a very good, new, she's a sports nutrition and uh, nutritionist. Actually, she has had a lot of credential. 
She has been a faculty for sports nutrition course uh, accredited to uh, Dr. Patil Deem University. She has worked with sports nutritionist Dr. Kannan Pukhalendi. She has worked with Dr. Sheila Krishnan Swami at former National President Indian Diabetic Association. Apart from that, she has written books on Elekala Manga, Unamum, Nalamum, and she has uh, I'm featured in so many TVs. I don't know, Kalinga TV, Jaya TV. My main thing is Adapangare uh, Kukari with Damodaran. And I should tell that, I mean, so many things are there. In addition, she has been a, a dietitian for many celebrities. I don't know, recently she told uh, Vijay Sethupadi, I don't know, Karthik, so many things. Either to become thin or even to become, Tanish wanted to become, to put on weight, she was the dietitian. And they were, somebody wants to put down. I'm not exaggerating. She never tells me, now and then I just hear it. So we are very eager to hear from you, nutrition for diabetic mothers. So over to Dr. Shiny, please. Thank you. Thank you, Auntie. Uh, uh. Okay. <laughs> okay, let me be formal here. Uh, thank you, Dr. Premalata. I'm so used to calling you Auntie because I've, I've known you since my childhood. It's such a privilege to be here and it's such an honor to be part of uh, this association. And uh, thanks to all the office bearers. Uh, may I share the screen, please? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Kindly let me know if you're able to do the screen in the slides. I'm going to be sharing a lot of practical tips. Uh, the reason being, we do have access to a lot of information and Dipsy and a lot of other portals. So I thought because uh, practicing brings a whole lot of challenges and I thought I'll just share the experiences that we have faced in our clinic. Okay, let's just go ahead. Okay, so we're going to be talking about the management of uh, gestational diabetes and of course the diet and we'll go through the summary. Uh, so, so the main thing is gestational diabetes is defined as the carbohydrate intolerance with recognition or onset of pregnancy. And we either treat it with diet or else with insulin. And the uh, biggest challenge that we face is there are just too many inputs that come when a woman is pregnant. There is, uh, of course, the in-laws, the mother, the mother-in-laws, and all of them have a thing or two to say. And that is where the confusion starts. It's like everyone pitches in and gives some kind of input or the other and uh, leaving the pregnant woman at complete confusion. Another factor is, you know, um, there could be elders who might just say, oh, you don't need a dietitian to tell you what to eat. And uh, there again is another challenge because it's more to, most to do with the mindset. So most often when uh, clients come, it's largely because gynecologist the obstetrician has actually referred a patient to us it's only then they would go ahead and take some advice okay and as we all know the two generations that are at risk mother who has increased risk for type 2 diabetes and of course the child later in life we know that is increased risk of diabetes mellitus right so the main thing that we have to consider uh, first is definitely the patient education. It's very, very important for them to know the implications of gestational diabetes, not just for the mother and also for the baby. Now, this has to be communicated or rather this information has to be disseminated to the entire family. So having a complete family there, at least, you know, the uh, spouse and of course the in-laws, I think that's just, this is very, very important. And also the dietary recommendations. And uh, because the specifics has to be given, uh, reason being, the fruits, especially during the mango season. This has happened to one of my own family member where during um, the mango season, during the summer, she went ahead and ate quite a lot of mangoes. This is my own sister-in-law who actually ended up with a lot of complications. Another factor is when you have a professional at home, they actually don't take you seriously. That's another factor. Main thing is mangoes again, you know, see you have social media and a lot of professionals give a lot of advice without any evidence-based information and uh, there was few years back there was one of the influencers who went ahead and spoke a lot about mangoes and then people started eating in large quantities and they really didn't bother about the sugars and that created quite a lot of problem across the country so the main thing is social media is one of the biggest challenges that we are all facing and every other person sometimes even unqualified people are giving advice on nutrition and diet and that becomes a huge challenge and if you look at the mangoes across India's across India the size 
of the fruit itself varies a lot. And in fact, the calorie calculations, everything has to be based on the age, gender, of course, the height, physical activity, the weight, and uh, also the body composition, all these factors. So it's very, very important that people do not follow social media because everyone has a phone and they have access to information. And that is where the problem starts. Dr. Google seems to be a go-to and that has brought in a whole lot of complications. Exercise recommendations, self-monitoring, and as well as identification and treatment of hypoglycemia. So the family needs to be sensitized that hypoglycemia is a big challenge and how they should be managing. I think that needs to be informed, rather communicated very clearly. Another thing is, of course, the sufficient calories. If you're looking at medical nutrition therapy, sufficient calories for adequate nutrition is very, very crucial, not just the macros, but also the micros, because there could be micronutrient deficiencies and we don't want a problem in hand and weight gain especially when these days a lot of young girls have pcos and we all are facing that and then there is also this underlying problem of insulin resistance so even before the wedding you know uh, usually we get to see a lot of school children right from class 10 to 12 because of the board exams the stress they're confined to homes they're not exercising much and that actually causes them to actually gain weight rapidly within a year or so they gain around 10 or 15 kgs surely because of the stress in uh, academics and then later it transfers to their education while they're in college there again they go through quite a lot of stress then by the time they get married they're really struggling with a huge amount of weight and just before the wedding for cosmetic reasons they might actually come and shed a lot of weight but then there is a quick regain of weight once they go on honeymoon and all that and in case they are not planning their pregnancies or if they haven't met the doctor and had a thorough discussion about when to have a baby um, again they're pretty clueless about how to go about or navigate through this entire scenario so i think it's very very important for women across age groups to be sensitized the importance of nutrition and how gestational diabetes if not managed could be uh, a huge threat for the mother as well as the baby <coughs> excuse me Weight gain is a huge challenge. So for someone who's already obese, say grade one obesity or is grade two, then from there when dealing with pregnancy is another big problem. So that's where the role of nutrition is very, very crucial. Calorie counting too. <coughs> Some focus only on calorie counting and do not actually look at the nutrient density. And that is where deficiencies come. <coughs> Excuse me. Insulin therapy, of course, this has to be specified. We can't give any kind of general statement. So this is, again, has to be closely worked with a diabetologist and, of course, the exercise specialist. <coughs> Please excuse me. I just seem to have a... So if we look at the calorie calculations and all of that, we definitely take the age, activity, the stage of pregnancy, as well as the pre-pregnancy weight into consideration. And approximate calories that are actually given is around 30 to 40 kilocal per kg, ideal body weight. And according to the uh, recommendations by the ICR, the National Institute of Nutrition, if you look at an average woman of, say, around 55 kgs, so there are different classifications when it comes to the sedentary worker or the moderate worker or the heavy worker. And of course, during lactation, we actually increase the calories by around 600 calories. And of course, anywhere between 6 to 12 months, it will be around 520 calories. That is it. But the problem is a lot of people start eating for two. Eating for two can pose a huge threat. And that is when um, a lot of calories are consumed, especially as simple sugars. Because when people visit a pregnant lady, they do go with a lot of sweets. They carry a lot of savories and a whole lot of goodies. And because of which they might you know, end up eating quite a lot. And the increase in weight itself becomes a huge uh, issue in controlling the blood sugar levels. So usually when we recommend, or rather any dietitian recommends, a diet, a fruit list, a vegetable list, the list of pulses to be used and what are the food groups and also rice varieties these days, if you see there are ancient rice, like you might have heard about Mapala Samba Arasi, Tuya um, and all these kind of ancient rice has been revived. And these are rich in iron, zinc, selenium, B-complex vitamins and everything. So again, more than the millets, ancient rice is much more popular and in vogue these days. And that actually contributes quite a lot to provide a lot of micronutrients. And the other challenges that we really get to see is uh, the nausea and of course constipation. So that is when fiber-rich foods are high 
highly recommended. So even when it comes to vegetables, more than the potato, yam, colocasia, or the roots and tubers, we, we would actually recommend a lot of goat vegetables, ash gourd, as well as beans and broad beans, a lot of green leafy vegetables. And this again is rich in folic acid as well. So this will ensure that they do not get constipated. And of course, the focus is also on hydration and also to replace the electrolytes. So if we look at the goal, so a healthy weight gain is what is uh, recommended or rather we focus and of course to make sure that the blood sugar levels are maintained well so timely meals is very crucial and also to ensure that the plate looks like this so whether you're a vegetarian or a non-vegetarian protein is something that is recommended for every meal even if it is a snack we recommend something like a fistful of potakadlai or it could be depending on their purchasing power you might even recommend some handful of nuts <coughs> So half of the plate should be filled with low starch vegetables and of course grains which are complex carbohydrates that is unpolished rice or else unpolished rice flakes or sometimes even small amounts of millets can also be given. Now for protein, non-vegetarian sources of protein or else plant proteins are recommended highly. Now what happens with legumes is if you're looking at kidney beans or else any of those garbans or beans or chickpeas, this is your chana that we have it with chapatis that can also ca cause a lot of bloating or flatulence and all that and cause quite a lot of discomfort. So that's when spices like ginger or else ajwain or you know, fennel seeds or all that has been recommended. Another factor is also to make sure that meals are split up, small meals at regular intervals, but the primary emphasis will be on complex carbohydrates and also to give high biological value proteins. So basically for a sedentary person, we would give around 0.8 to 1 gram per kg body weight. And most often we notice that only around 30 to 40 grams of protein is um, uh, being consumed by most of the common people. So I think the emphasis here is on getting quality protein. And of course, the high fiber vegetables and definitely to avoid because a lot of people these days consume carrot beetroot juices because they want the complexion to be much better. Some even drink these kind of juices because they want their children to be fair. So there are all kinds of myths and misconceptions floating around. And if they are going to be taking carrot beetroot and orange juices and all that, because these are high in glycemic index, definitely the blood sugar fluctuations are going to be very, very high. Another factor, of course, is the fruits. And uh, a lot of people end up consuming quite a lot of fruits. And the problem is the fructose, which is there. So we actually give portion sizes. So we might say three different fruits and then say, take if it's a cut fruit, take 100 grams of fruit. Or if it is like, say, a guava, don't take the ripe ones, but take the green variety. That's much better. And even among apples, instead of the Fiji apples or else these uh, Californian apples, we would recommend Shimla apples, which are smaller in size and which are not too sweet. And among oranges, we might say, don't buy those Australian oranges or the Malta oranges, but please buy the Nagpur oranges or the Kamala orange that is available in Tamil Nadu. So these are the kind of specifications that we go into each and every fruit and vegetable, teaching or rather guiding them how to go ahead with cooking as well as to um, food purchase, preparation, as well as uh, consumption and storage. So that, you know, storage is very important, especially if there is non-vegetarian food being made. We don't want microbial contamination. So the way they uh, store these um, non-vegetarian foods, for example, in certain households, one to two kg meat is purchased over Sunday and then they actually store it and use it across the week. So we would actually recommend that we split it up and have seven different boxes, say from Monday to Sunday, so that the meat is thawed at the right temperature and then if you're taking one box for one portion size that is utilized by the end of the day and not carried over and not heated again because this way you can actually prevent any kind of food poisoning and of course the microbial contamination so we usually dissuade people from storing the entire one kg or two kg chicken or any kind of uh, meat as a whole portion but to split it up into daily portion sizes and we all know how important it is for a pregnant woman to uh, ensure that she takes adequate iron-rich foods, calcium-rich foods, folic acid, B12, vitamin D, as well as zinc. So there is quite a lot of emphasis, and we also teach them how to include them in the daily food. So heme iron or non-heme iron, whether they are a vegetarian or a non-vegetarian, there are plenty of options. So they are educated on how to go about purchasing, even when they go to supermarkets, to go ahead, read food labels. And any, whoever, the attender, whoever accompanies the pregnant woman, they are also educated on these aspects so that they make prudent food choices. 
another factor is milk and milk products is very in but at the same time these days you'll also find a lot of people hesitate to drink milk and there are a lot of vegan um, uh, vegetarians or rather vegans who actually come for counseling so that way we actually provide them a whole lot of other options plant based protein powders and plant based nutrition is very very popular these days and of course nuts and seeds are also very crucial because of the omega 3 fatty acids and of course the zinc selenium and a whole lot of magnesium manganese which come in through that and millets in small quantities depending on how well they are able to digest millets are provided largely starting with small amounts and then gradually to just one meal only again it's very very subjective and this has to be customized so definitely things to avoid for a person who's prone or rather been diagnosed with gestational diabetes is definitely no maida products refined flours are totally avoided and juices because this is the phase or this is the era where people are taking smoothie bowls and green rather different kinds of juices and all that and a lot of information is available on social media youtube and all that so they just get carried away so we strictly say please do not take any kind of juices or kind of milkshakes so the best would be to eat a whole fruit and that to only specific fruits which have lower sugar content and then breads and pasta because maida based products is best avoided but you do have whole grain pastas which are available or sourdough bread which is available which can be taken again processed foods or highly processed or packaged foods are best avoided because they do have flavorings food additives emulsifiers and food colors as well junk food again best avoided and not to eat outside so even if they are traveling we tell them what to pack and carry so that the uh, you know the entire journey is very comfortable and soft drinks packed fruit juices uh, which are sugar loaded are best avoided cakes or any kind of confectionery bakery products chocolates preservatives and food colors too so i just wanted to share a case study this will give you a fair idea of how a meal plan is you know devised so there was varsha who contacted us she's just 32 years and uh, you know 3 months pregnant and she had a history of pcos and she conceived with iui so the nutritional plan was to prevent gestational diabetes her blood sugar levels showed a slight increase so the gynecologist had recommended or rather referred them to us so this was a diet history she used to drink coffee first thing in the morning a little bit was a lot for her and then of course she used to have three doses with some chutney okay pudina chutney or else tenga chutney is what coconut chutney was she was taking and of course there was nothing in the mid morning but she will go ahead and have lunch with very little sabzi or a vegetable curry uh, but then of course she would include either sambar or rasam if you notice it's sambar or rasam so which means the rasam doesn't have enough protein the sambar is much more uh, a better source for protein next thing was evening uh, she didn't really like cow's milk so she was taking around uh, that is a chocolate almond milk which was having sugar and of course she would also include some kind of fruit which was available in season and her dinner was chapati and tomato curry if you notice the dinner there's two chapatis of course there is fiber there but the problem is the tomato curry it doesn't have enough fiber or rather it doesn't have enough protein so what we had prescribed was to start a day with soaked almonds or walnuts because it's much easier to digest and also reduces the phytic acid component and of course to have some coffee because she didn't like uh, cow's milk we said plain almond milk with which she could prefer coffee and then of course breakfast instead of just the white rice dosa she could actually take pesar to or else adai which were better sources of protein and of course a glass of thin buttermilk because it's a great source of probiotic or else it could be lemon juice alternate days she could either take buttermilk or lemon juice but lemon juice of course is a good source of vitamin c and it also enhances the uptake or um, of iron so it enhances iron absorption then of course thin buttermilk with some chia seeds somewhere in between because this is going to be very very helpful because chia seeds has this uh, gelatinous texture and it also suppresses hunger so she wouldn't be eating unnecessary snacks or anything in between and it will also keep her feel uh, very satiated then of course brown rice or quinoa is recommended along with some porial and a kootu or a dal or kheera with dal so parpa kheera or something those kind of things were recommended so there are actually two servings of vegetables in her lunch along with a little bit of curd again a great source of calcium as well as probiotic evening again it was almond milk just like what she was taking but then after a gap of 2 hours a fruit was recommended now closer to the dinner is where she was taking fruit now this again if you notice the dinner we had included soup so this is a great way to step up the fiber which lenses that she doesn't get constipated and at the same time 
she'll also be able to control the amount of food that she's consuming without compromising on the antioxidants in the fiber the vitamins and minerals so soup with dosa or roti with mushroom curry or else paneer or else non veg gravy so this is how modifications are done so taking the diet history and then tweaking it a little bit and constantly being in touch so we create a whatsapp group we recommend them to take photographs and upload it regularly and we also give inputs and every single day we monitor them this is how we've been working so making the best use of technology to monitor the clients on a regular basis food diary regular follow ups regular monitoring is the key because each and every day there are so many changes challenges fears and of course there are inputs from friends family and a lot of social media so places where people do not actually talk or rather when they come for diet consultation things that are never discussed or rather it just gets brushed aside is where the festivals the the kind of food stuffs that they eat during festivals or else if someone goes to a temple and brings a prasadam say for instance someone goes to tirupati and brings a laddu they'll say this is good for your baby please go ahead and take it and if they go ahead and have a large quantity then this is something that never comes up so there could be under reporting when it comes to a diet recall another fact that is when the girl actually goes and stays in her mother's uh, house there could be a lot of visitors who come and then if she likes her mother's food so much she might end up eating a lot more so i think uh, these are things that we really have to discuss and portion sizes have to be monitored so taking photographs and uploading and then being accountable to a dietitian truly helps Uh, in the long run now the fact is these days it's become very fashionable or rather the regular seemandam now has become a proper baby shower with photo shoot and everything so that's when cake and everything has become the norm they cut the cake they have a whole lot of muffins and everything there are theme based parties which are there in the urban setting so we get to see in the urban setting that a lot of women end up gaining weight because of these kind of celebrations and these things just go unnoticed these are never discussed okay so again during the baby shower it could be a regular scene when them say for instance in a, a rural setting again the kind of sweets and all that that is given to a pregnant woman th- those are also consumed so people really need to understand portion sizes so how do we go about doing that so if it's protein it's better to look at the you know teach them the easiest way is to say that palm sized and this thickness because that way it's much easier for them to understand rather than showing them weighing scales and um, weigh the food every time next is of course the vegetables as i mentioned no roots and tubers but then anything which is high in fiber and low in starch so we just say a handful that will be much more easier or else show them a bowl so we usually give them standard measuring cups and then give it to them and exactly tell them how much to consume fat this much so one teaspoon of fat so more for tempering and seasoning that is what has been recommended and carbohydrate will say this amount of rice okay so it could be a, a handful so this is much more easier and next is of course a lot of emphasis on hydration because if they are nauseous or if they are vomiting quite a lot they are losing a lot of electrolytes and we don't want dehydration in hand so that's when the importance of hydration is emphasized over and over again and also to of course to uh, keep the energy levels high and to prevent constipation sleep levels get largely disturbed especially because of television and all of that and stress management is also recommended so that is where the yoga or as any kind of activity comes in sunlight exposure very important for the pregnant women and immunity enhancing foods should be recommended especially during these times of covid okay so uh, i'm done with the presentation uh, thank you dr premilata dr dhan lakshmi and dr kundavi and the entire team at oxy thanks so much for this wonderful opportunity to be to be part of uh, the presentation or the webinar today very humble uh, thanks for the invitation thank you shaini actually you have uh, nicely taken us through the all the uh, uh, levels how we have to take uh, teach the pregnant women with the food cabin i just want to know what about banana you didn't tell about the banana you are telling um, always you are against my uh usually no i wouldn't recommend yes yeah. Uh, because again if it is karpura vaadi or else malavaadi palam or the hill variety or if it is the green banana that is the morris or the red variety or the nendram palam so uh, in our country if we say eat a banana a small size banana again it varies across the states the size of the banana everything varies so i think it's very very important we usually do not recommend banana the fruits we recommend are apple pear guava 100 grams of papaya and then oranges that is kamala orange not the imported variety at all and of course um, 100 grams of pomegranate and maybe one thin slice of pineapple that's it jackfruit grapes mangoes bananas are best avoided 
So Karpura Valley can be taken. What I can't understand. Uh, Karpura Valley again a small portion size, just a hundred grams, and that is it. That is all is recommended. Yeah. There are no questions in the chat box. Anything? Anybody, Doctor Dana, you want uh, ask her anything? Uh, I, I was also very concerned about this uh, bananas. People tend to eat bananas to avoid constipation. And yes. Yeah. The, so I have to really wean them off. Actually, they are used to loads of bananas. They take two, three uh, per day, and uh, that really does not control the early morning sugars or the night sugars. So after cutting down on bananas and substituting with something else like an apple or a go uh, goya. Uh, Goa, like uh, they are able to maintain their sugars, and uh, uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Shiny Surendran, and I think I corrected your surname correctly in the agenda, and for being with us today, and uh, let uh, Madam introduce the next speaker. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Shiny. Thank you, Shiny. Now I will go, and I like to introduce Dr. Next speaker, Dr. Sheila Kepille. She is an associate professor and senior consultant from Sri Ramachandra Medical College. She is a UG and PG teacher. She has published several articles on national and international journals. Has been part of organizing team of various academic events in Sri Ramachandra Hospital. She is uh, she is uh, here to talk on pharmacological management of diabetes in pregnancy. Over to Dr. Sheila. Good evening, ma'am. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Very much. Okay. Okay. Let me share my screen. So, good evening, everyone. First, at the outset, I would like to thank the Oxy organizers, uh, Premlata Madam, and our own Danalakshmi Madam, Kundavi Madam, and all the other office bearers for this wonderful opportunity. So. The topic given to me is pharmacological management of diabetes in pregnancy. Is my screen visible, ma'am? Yeah, it is visible. You can go for a uh, slideshow, ma'am. Above, you can have this. Uh... One second, ma'am. The on top the is a slideshow. The, slide uh, uh, the top panel you have slideshow. Left can, side, left side. Go to the left side. Here, here, left side, here. Slideshow. Left and side, left side. Still more left, I, left corner. Left, left. Left pan, near the, uh, no, still more right. Now you come to the right. Animation, after know? that, after animation, slideshow. Yeah, 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 sorry, sorry. Click it and then uh, clear from beginning. From beginning again, go to breath from beginning here. here. So below, below, white one. Below. Yeah, from beginning, from beginning, beginning, from beginning, the white, white one. One second, left, 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 from left, 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 left. From below, 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 below. Yeah, yeah, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. Sorry, ma'am, that was something I was not used to doing on this. No, you are audible, you can start, ma'am. Oh, okay, ma'am. So coming to the pharmacological management of diabetes in pregnancy. So we know we were, we were extensively hearing about nutrition and uh, again diet. And when these two fail, we have to move to the next step as far as prevention. I mean, the management of diabetes is concerned. And uh, there comes a pharmacological management. So when diet and exercise fail to achieve consistently target glucose levels, that is, if the glucose measurements somebody, the patient makes, about all the more than 50% of those glucose measurements are elevated above the glycemic target, that means she needs medications. So we have the two options, the, the time-tested option being insulin and the second option being the oral hypoglycemic agents. So first we'll go to the oral hypoglycemic agents because insulin was the standard drug and still continues to be the standard drug for most of us. So coming to OHAs, the two drugs that we have to discuss, one is metformin and the other is glyburide. So these two are the preferred agents. OHAs actually form a reasonable alternative to those who refuse to take insulin or those who are unable to comply with insulin therapy. So this is how they came into our um, use. And But here we have to remember that always we have to counsel them regarding the unknown long-term side effects of the transplacental passage of the oral agents. And again, we have to remember that a lady with pre-gestational diabetes who's having a satisfactory glucose control on OHAs can be asked to continue it in pregnancy unless she chooses to switch over to insulin. 
Also, we have to remember that of late, both the ACOG and the American Diabetic Association acknowledge that several studies support the safety and efficacy of these two drugs. So first, we'll go to metformin. As we all know, metformin is a bioguanide and insulin sensitizer, which is used to improve glycemic control by increasing insulin sensitivity. It has an inhibitory effect on glu hepatic glucose production and intestinal glucose absorption. It stimulates glucose uptake in the liver and peripheral tissues. Metformin, as we all know, crosses the placenta freely and renders the fetal concentration which is roughly 50% or even more than that of the I mean, concentration in the maternal circulation. It has a urinary excretion and reaches peak concentration four hours and has a half-life of two to five hours. 90% of it gets excreted in 12 hours. So it is actually a drug which is highly effective in normal or slightly overweight women or those with mildly elevated fasting blood sugar levels. It really does not stimulate insulin secretion. Hence, there is no maternal hypoglycemia. It freely crosses the placenta due to all these reasons like low molecular mass, hydrophilic nature and lack of protein binding. And it may reach up to 50% or even more than that of the maternal concentration in the fetal circulation. And there are no reported congenital anomalies. It is not teratogenic and no neonatal lactic acidosis occurs. It is a category B drug. So the studies will show, show us that the hypoglycemia following metformin may range from 0 to 10%. 5 to 15% of those who take metformin can have side effects like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, flatulence. Lactic acidosis is rare, especially if the dose is increased gradually. It is safe to breastfeed even in the postpartum period when they are on metformin and maternal milk levels are quite low. So ideally, usually we start with a low dose that is about maybe 500 milligram daily at night or so for a week and then slowly increase the dose. And the maximum dosage recommended is 2,500 or maximum up to 3,000 milligram per day as divided doses. So we'll come to the trials. MIG trial is metformin in gestational diabetes trial carried out in 2008. So it was done by Rowan and colleagues who compared the outcome of 751 women and fetuses allocated to insulin therapy or metformin for GDM treatment. So no differences in congenital malformations, serious maternal events or serious neonatal events were observed in the two groups, but they also observed that the maternal weight gain in pregnancy was less in the metformin group. And there were no serious neonatal events as already mentioned. And they also noted that metformin use resulted in significantly less neonatal hypoglycemia, that is 3.3% versus 8.1% with a p-value less than 0.008. But what was unexpected was a high rate of preterm delivery, which was 12.1% versus 7.6% in the insulin group with a p-value of 0.04. Also, it was noted that there was quite a lot of failure, that is 26 to 46% of those who started with metformin alone eventually required insulin. And MIG TOFU trial 2011 is a two-year follow-up on the MIG trial babies. So they were following up these babies and those in the metformin arm had more subcutaneous fat in the upper arm and shoulder compared to those in the insulin arm. But overall growth of the offspring at two years did not differ between insulin and metformin groups. Another trial, this is actually metformin, the role of metformin in women with type 2 diabetes in pregnancy, MITI trial, published in October 2020 by D.S. Pegger et al. and uh, his group. So it is a prospective multicenter, randomized, parallel, double mass, placebo control trial conducted in Canada and Australia from 2011 to 2018, which investigates the effects of the addition of metformin to a standard regimen of insulin and the effects of this on the neonatal morbidity and mortality in pregnant women with type 2 diabetes. So here actually 1000 mg metformin twice daily or placebo was added to people who were on a standard regimen of insulin and no difference in composite neonatal outcome was noted between both the arms. So in the MITI trial, they've also documented that there's a better glycemic control in the metformin group where the metformin was added to the standard regime of insulin and the insulin requirement was also less in this metformin group of, uh, of the stat arm and less maternal weight gain and fewer cesarean sections were noted in the metformin group, but they didn't have a significant difference between the two groups in hypertensive disorders, unlike certain other studies. And also in the metformin group, the infants weight less. This could be a reason for the fewer cesarean sections. 
Fewer babies were above the 97th centile and fewer babies weighed above 4,000 grams. And these babies who received, whose mothers received insulin with metformin had lesser adiposity measures and mean neonatal fat mass and they had higher proportion of SGA babies actually, 13% versus 7%. MITI KIDS trial actually is a trial that follows up the babies of these mothers who are in the MITI trial for the adiposity and insulin resistance at two years of age. The reports are yet to come out. Now coming to glyburide. Glyburide is a second generation sulfonylurea. It's an insulin secretagogue, which is not very popular in our part of the country. It increases the insulin secretion and sensitivity in peripheral tissues and reduces hepatic insulin clearance. This is a drug which is well absorbed with oral administration, reaches a peak concentration at about three hours and has a half-life of eight hours. It is not dependent on food intake and is metabolized by the liver. It actually decreases the circulating glucose by approximately 20% and it is most effective in those of normal weight or slightly overweight. The dosage starts with 2.5 to 5 milligram daily or twice daily, reaching up to a maximum dose of 20 milligram per day in a twice daily dosing. So initial studies actually showed that there was no detectable glyburide in the cord blood, but later studies have revealed that umbilical cord blood concentration is about 70% of the drug concentration in the maternal circulation. This was uh, shown by studies by Caritas in 2013. Also, the maternal and neonatal outcomes were comparable with respect to glycemic control and adverse events for glyburide and insulin. No congenital anomalies have been detected so far. It is categorized as a category C drug, and also there are studies which show that there is less likely maternal hypoglycemia compared to insulin when glyburide is given. So the percentage here is one to 5%. And also the severity of the hypoglycemia is lesser when compared to the hypoglycemia that happens with insulin. And hypoglycemia with glyburide can happen both during day and night. Whereas insulin, as we all know, causes more severe hypoglycemia on many occasions, less than 40 milligram per deciliter of glucose levels in the blood. And it is more often nocturnal. And other minor side effects of glyburide include nausea, heartburn, mild itching, skin rashes, and sometimes mildly elevated liver function tests. Negligible levels have been detected in breast milk as well as infant blood. There are some meta-analysis in 2015 by Balsers and colleagues which have showed that there are some adverse, I mean, which reduce the popularity of glyburide, which show that glyburide use actually caused twofold increase in the neonatal hypoglycemia two-fold increase in macrosomia and a 100 gram increase in birth weight when compared to traditional insulin therapy. Also, studies with glyburide have shown about 4 to 16 percent failure rate, that is 4 to 16 percent of patients who took glyburide initially needed addition of insulin eventually. So, between metformin and glyburide, both are actually well tolerated and preferred by women. Normal and slightly overweight women and those with mildly elevated fasting blood sugar levels are the best candidates for OHAs. The prevalence of congenital anomalies and short-term neonatal adverse events are not different between insulin and OHAs. But whenever we are counseling a pregnant patient with diabetes for OHAs, we, the counseling must address that long-term and large-scale safety data are limited. And US FDA has not approved these drugs for the management of GDM, whereas American College recognizes both drugs as reasonable choices for second line glycemic control in women with GDM as per the 2017 practice bulletins. And as long term outcomes have not been fully studied, the committee recommends appropriate counseling, which includes disclosing the limitations in the current safety data because we don't have long term large scale data regarding the safety of these drugs. Metformin versus glyburide, and we have two studies comparing the two drugs where metformin treatment was associated with lesser maternal weight gain, lower birth weight, and less of macrosomia. Coming to the role of OHAs in pregestational diabetes mellitus, there is limited data on their usage in pregnancy. Again, metformin and glyburide are the agents for use in safe, safe use in pregnancy, and this is actually used in patients with type 2 diabetes who decline insulin. And uh, as we already said, glyburide has been associated with increased incidence of fetal macrosomia and neonatal hypoglycemia than either metformin or insulin. Whereas metformin does not seem to be associated with fetal risk. And first trimester usage reduces the risk of miscarriage. These are some of the advantages with metformin. There is no increased risk of congenital formations, but 
It is likely to be insufficient for glycemic control in those two, those with type 2 diabetes, especially as the pregnancy advances. Coming to insulin, insulin is the drug that we know from long time back, which has been used as a standard treatment for diabetes in pregnancy where diet and exercise fade. It's the most well-studied and used treatment for DDM as well as diabetes mellitus. It does not cross the placenta. It is a large molecule that doesn't cross the placenta and it can achieve tight glycemic control. It's the only regimen approved by the US FDA for the treatment of GDM. So typically the regimens have short acting insulins and long acting insulins and the dosings and regimens should be individualized. Requirements increase with gestational age as insulin resistance increases with increasing placental mass. So these are the weight-based guidelines for insulin therapy. So it says that according to the weeks of gestational age, the insulin requirement also varies. From the beginning of pregnancy to 13 weeks and six days, it says 0.7 units per kg body weight. From 14 to 27 weeks and six out of seven days, it is 0.8 units per kilogram. From 28 to 35 weeks and six days, it is 0.9 units per kilogram. And from 36 weeks till delivery, it is one unit per kilogram body weight of the patient. Management with insulin. So the divide, actually, this is what we have been following conventionally. The total dose of insulin is divided into two-thirds long-acting and one-third short-acting insulin. And actually, we can divide the short-acting insulin into three doses to cover with the meals. We should also remember that uh, the hyperglycemia varies from patients to patients. And some of the patients, especially those who have a increased fasting, we may need to give them only one night dose of long-acting or intermediate-acting insulin. Whereas if somebody has high postprandial values following breakfast or following a major meal, we will have to cover that hyperglycemia with a short-acting insulin dose associated with the meals. So actually, we can divide the short-acting insulin into three doses with meals. And whenever the patient is administered maternal corticosteroids as for the lung maturity purpose, then there should be close assessment of the glucose levels once every four hours due to increased risk of transient hyperglycemia. So what are the insulins that now we have and now which are popularly available? Among the short-acting insulins, we have aspart insulin, lispro insulin, and regular. Regular insulin is the one which have been spring in the market for a long time, whereas aspart and lispro are the new rapidly acting insulin analogs that have been used of late. Intermediate acting insulins, we had the protamine hexdone insulin and the lente insulin. Protamine hexdone is the NPH insulin. And long-acting insulins, which we have, one is the glargine insulin, which is the lantus and the timer. So this is about the common types of insulins being used. In, with those with a short duration of action, we have the time-tested regular insulin with an onset of action at 30 minutes and the peak action at 2 to 4 hours and duration of action of 8 to 10 hours. Lispro and Aspart are the two rapidly acting insulin analogs where the onset of action is as short as uh, 15 minutes. So the advantage about Lispro and Aspart is that we can time them in such a way that they're just taken just before the meal, whereas in regular, we usually advise them to take it 15 minutes before the meal and then they wait and take the food. Whereas in such a situation, always there is a risk of some hypoglycemia happening, whereas with Lispro and Aspart, they can be taken as soon as the meal is ready and the patient is going to start eating the meal so because they have a very quick onset of action. And the peak is achieved in these two with one to two hours and one to two and a half hours respectively. And the total duration of action is about four to six hours. And among the intermediate acting insulins, NPH insulin has an onset of one to two hours and a peak of five to seven hours with a total duration of 12 to 18 hours. Lente has an onset at one to three hours, peak at four to eight hours and total duration of 18 to 20 hours. The long acting insulin analogs, we have glargine and detima. Glargine, of course, is being used in many patients with the high fasting levels where you need a basal insulin at the night. The onset is at about one hour plus. And the peak, initially, we decided we were thinking that both of them don't have a, it's more like a peakless insulin. But there is a sort of a short peak at around five hours and the total duration of action of 20 to 24 hours. Whereas the timer is the um, less studied variety where the onset is one to two hours and the short peak at five hours and the total duration of about 20 hours. Now we come to a little more details about the rapid acting insulin analogs. They are the preferred choice for prandial insulin dosing over the regular insulin. The two varieties that are available, one is insulin aspart and the other is insulin lispro. Insulin aspart is a human novelog and insulin lispro is a human, I mean, is the humalog variety. 
The superior pharmacological profiles, as we said earlier, because they have got a very quick onset of action, a rapid peak, greater flexibility, convenient dosing, because just before the meal they can have it, and there is a greater patient satisfaction because of, the of all these. They have a shorter onset of action, peak action, and duration of action. And there is less mean glucose excursion in response to food bolus and less hypoglycemia between the meals. Insulin is pro. Studies have shown that it is not associated with higher rates of congenital malformations or fetal overgrowth when compared to the standard insulin therapy. Fewer episodes of hypoglycemia in those with GDM, and there is lower BMI, lower vascular complications, and total insulin requirements are also less in those with the pre-gestation diabetes mellitus also. And lower HbA1c levels have been recorded in those treated with insulin lispro. Insulin as part has got a better postprandial glucose control when compared to regular insulin, but it had higher number of hypoglycemic events associated, but the hypoglycemic events were not severe, requiring assistance from another individual, whereas insulin can cause severe hypoglycemic events. Higher peak insulin concentrations were achieved when compared to regular insulin, and the obstetrical outcomes were similar to regular insulin. Like rates of perinatal mortality, congenital malformations, rates of large for gestational age babies, and neonatal hypoglycemia were all similar to regular insulin in the Machines spelling, mouse, mouse spelling, robot spelling, computer spelling, keyboard spelling. Alphabet key, number Insulin as part. Uh, is, was not, it was undetectable in cordial oh, samples and it was less studied than insulin lispro in pregnancy. Both insulin lispro and insulin aspart have comparable transplacental passage, immunogenicity and clinical efficacy. Less data is available on fetal overgrowth, maternal and perinatal outcomes. Now we come to the long-acting insulin analogs, most commonly prescribed using one daily dosing regimen, especially commonly at night most often used in women with type 1 diabetes mellitus. The nocturnal basal rate of one's daily dosing is often inadequate in GDM patients to counteract the greater insulin resistance and higher insulin requirements during daytime hours. So this is where long-acting insulins have less role in patients with GDM. So insulin glargain, it's a molecule that is less soluble and thus forms a depot which allows for slow release which results in a lengthy, constant concentration of insulin without a pronounced peak and less hypoglycemia. The resultant once daily dosing enhances patient acceptance and satisfaction. It, you should remember that it cannot be mixed with other insulin formulations. There is no transplacental passage at maternal therapeutic concentrations. And studies with insulin glargin have shown that there is no difference in gestational age at delivery, birth weight, and the incidence of uh, respiratory distress syndrome and NICU admissions in those treated with insulin glargin in comparison with NPH. Total dose of basal insulin was less in those treated with insulin glargin when compared to NPH, which is our standard insulin that has been being used for a longer period of time. Insulin glargin, again, maternal outcomes like rates of hypoglycemia, preeclampsia, and cesarean delivery were similar. Rates of LGA babies, APGAR scores, neonatal hypoglycemia, hyperbilirubinemia, and NICU admissions were similar between insulin glargin and NPH groups. Fewer macrosomic infants and lower rates of neonatal hyperbilirubinemia were noted in a pre-gestational cohort who were treated with insulin glargin. Insulin detima, this is a less popular variety for us. Insulin detima studies in non-pregnant women have shown more consistent absorption compared to insulin glargin and NPH insulin. It has shorter duration of action compared to glargin insulin and most of the time has a twice daily dosing. And small studies on type 1 diabetic women have shown no significant maternal or neonatal adverse effects. Actually, it needs more studies to evaluate the use of insulin detima in women with GDM. So insulin analogs on the whole in GDM, most studied analogs are insulin mispro and insulin aspart. That is, the rapidly acting insulin analogs are clinically effective with insignificant placental transfer and low immunogenicity. The use of long acting insulin analogs in pregnancy needs large scale randomized studies. So, what are the recommended glucose targets according to the ADA Diabetes Care 2014? Fasting is less than 95 milligram per deciliter or 5.3 millimoles per liter. Preprandial, that is before meals, should be 100, less than or equal to 100 milligram per deciliter or 5.6 millimoles per liter. One hour postprandial should be less than or equal to 140 milligram per deciliter, that is 7.8 millimoles per liter. 
two hour postprandial should be less than 120 or equal to less than 120 milligram per deciliter or 6.7 millimoles per liter. And mean capillary glucose should be 100 milligram per deciliter or 5.6 millimoles per liter. And during the night, the glucose levels should be more than or equal to 60, that is 60 to 90 milligram per uh, deciliter, which is equivalent to 3.3 to 5.9 millimoles per liter. And HbA1c, of course, should be less than 6%. So one more slide on insulin therapy in pre-gestational diabetes mellitus. So the goal to achieve capillary glucose levels between 70 to 110 milligram per deciliter without hypoglycemia. We can use both multiple daily injections and continuous subcutaneous insulin infusions. Individualize the treatment for optimum glucose control where you give 50 to 60% of the total dose as basal insulin and the rest as prandial dosage split into three or more injections of short-acting insulin to cover the meals. The basal insulin that is delivered is either as intermediate or long-acting. It suppresses the hepatic gluconeogenesis during fasting state and also between the meals. Commonly, we can use yeah. NPH. Detimoglagin can be continued in those who benefit from one's daily basal insulin dosing. The bolus dosing of the short-acting insulin is required with meals to mimic the prandial insulin secretion. So the basal will cover for the fasting state and also between meals, whereas the short-acting bolus will cover the prandial I mean, for the meals, uh, so that it acts like the prandial insulin secretion. And as we said earlier, both Vispro and Aspart are safe in pregnancy and work better than regular insulin in those with pre-gestational diabetes mellitus. A word, a slide about hypoglycemia. So the more commonest or the greatest frequency of hypoglycemia is seen between 8 to 16 weeks of pregnancy. And uh, this is the time when they have more of nausea, vomiting and other problems. The usual subjective experience of hypoglycemia awareness would be obtained in pregnancy, necessitating most of times a third party assistance. So the vulnerable women should be counseled for more frequent sampling before planned activities like driving. They need to carry readily available calories with them. And also the partners, friends, close relatives and colleagues should be advised regarding the use of preparations like glucose gel or glucose preparation. Please. Please, all of you, those who are not talking, please mute yourself, ma. Coming to the future, modern short-acting sulfonylurea drugs and metformin will have an increasing place in the management of GDM. Metformin will be the drug of choice for those entering pregnancy who are overweight or obese. And those who have difficulty with glycemic control, especially with type 1 diabetes mellitus, will be helped by feedback devices which combine a continuous glucose monitoring system with automated insulin infusion by a continuous subcutaneous insulin infusion regime in the future. So I think I've covered most of the things I thought uh, monitoring and also labor and delivery will be covered by the next speaker. So I take this opportunity to thank the office bearers of Oxy, Nana Ma'am and Premlata Madam and others for giving me this opportunity. Thank you so much. Uh, Sheila, you have nicely taken us through all the various like uh, metformin therapy, glyburet therapy, and also about uh, uh, insulin, rapid acting, and all this, uh, uh, everything you have uh, detailed it told. Actually, I'll just ask you, yes, if you are uh, having a patient with you at 20 weeks, you're diagnosed to be a gestation diabetes, irrespective of the BMI, do you want to give only insulin or you want to start her on metformin nowadays? Nowadays, yes. actually, we have patients who we actually try with metformin, ma'am. And then, because patients also nowadays, when we straight away tell insulin, the, there is some resistance from their end also, ma'am, because they also, all those Googling everything. So we try to start definitely with metformin. And if that is really not working, we, by the time they'll also accept it and they'll get convinced so that we can slowly switch over them to insulin along with metformin so that the total dosage of insulin also remains less, ma'am. Have you heard, uh, because uh, for years together, we were only uh, giving insulin. them on insulin therapy. Now with the uh, metformin therapy, it is most patient-friendly and the patients are able to accept. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma have you find, when are the conditions where you may have to give OHA along with the insulin therapy? Can you have any conditions when you start both? Ma'am, actually, they say that uh, especially our patients with PCOS and all who were already on metformin, and uh, in such patients, some of the consultants will be still continuing metformin in the first trimester as such without even high sugar. So these are the patients in whom we continue. 
and also patients who have uh, like uh, as we said earlier who have just missed the target by a little not like having a very high listing of over dm so these are the patients whom we can actually start with metformin and uh, continue with the metformin and if we feel that the target is not being achieved by them and especially the baby is also growing on the higher side we sl slowly start them on insulin also and continue the tumor I don't know, always, though the study says the metformin therapy has a low birth weight and no macroscopy. Yes. Many a times I feel when the patient is on insulin therapy, their babies are looking very normal. But okay, if the patient is on meal plan or a, a metformin therapy, many a times the baby looks a little like bigger, a, with more yeah. like her also, maybe. You okay. have to have a study and everything. Thank you, doctor. There is no questions in the chat box. Okay. So I think we can go with the next speaker. Next speaker is Dr. Archana. She's going to talk about monitoring in pregnancy, the, how to monitor the maternal glucose and monitor for the fetal growth in a diabetic pregnancy. She's a UG from Chengalpattu Medical College and she's a PG from Sri Ramachandra Medical College and she's a gold medalist in uh, university first in uh, and gold medalist for best outgoing student. She has hands-on training in fertility enhancing surgeries from SR 2017, basic laparoscopy training in Foxy accredited center in 2019. Uh, 19. She is presently working as an assistant professor in government Omandura Medical College. Over to Dr. Archana. A very good evening to one and all present here. Uh, Doctor, I am Dr. Uh, Archana Kandasamy here to talk about monitoring maternal glucose and fetal growth in diabetic patients. So uh, we are going to deal with glucose monitoring in antenatal period, intrapartum and postnatal period, including the fetal surveillance and the fetal growth and uh, certain uh, selected antenatal patients, how we manage about them. So why do we monitor? We have been dealing with screening and uh, ma'am had dealt with uh, treatment. So in between, there's something called as monitoring. So what is the importance of monitoring maternal glucose after we screen, diagnose and treat? The success of the treatment during GDM or diabetes in pregnancy depends on the glycemic control. So we have to monitor glucose. So to know the effectiveness of treatment also, monitoring is required. So uh, to move on to uh, monitoring, we all need to know the consequences of diabetes and pregnancy. So we are all aware of the maternal and fetal complications. I would like to highlight the maternal complications such as development of type 2 diabetes mellitus in future in the uh, GDM patients and progression to any chronic complications of diabetes. In the fetal side, apart from the intrapartum complications, as we all know about uh, shoulder dystocia, we need to uh, remember that it can cause childhood obesity in that uh, neonate or uh, when they grow up. And uh, also about the increased risk of type 2 diabetes mellitus and GDM later in the child's life. So why do we have to monitor in the antenatal period? So when in antenatal period, there's a poor antipartum glycemic control, the fetus exposure to uh, hyperglycemia is prolonged. So what happens to their fetal pancreatic uh, cells? It undergoes hyperplasia and excessive in utero insulin secretion. So these neonates are at risk of developing severe and prolonged hyperglycemia when they are delivered. So uh, what the recommendations are about glucose monitoring in the antenatal period. So our NHM and uh, universally they recommend intermittent self-monitoring of blood glucose. So once before breakfast is being done, then one or two hours after the beginning of each meal, blood glucose monitoring is being done. Here, one hour postprandial monitoring has several benefits. There are various studies which tells this. Why? Because of better met, uh, glycemic management. There's lower incidence of large for gestational uh, age of newborns. Lower rate of cesarean section for uh, cephalopelvic disproportion. So in case of GDM, what the recommendations are is we uh, monitor glucose four times a day, fasting and three post meals. In case of pre-existing diabetes, we do measure it five to seven times fasting, pre-meals, post-meals and a 3 a.m. Here, additional testing can be done if they show symptoms of hypoglycemia with treatment of either OG or insulin. And uh, in certain patients where self-monitoring is not possible, we do a fasting and a postprandial blood sugar at two weekly interval. And after 34 weeks, we do it weekly. 
So these are the recommendations to monitor in antenatal period. Uh, RCOG also recommends the same in type 1, type 2 diabetes and GDM who are on multiple daily insulin injection regimen here, fasting, pre-meal, one hour post-meal and bedtime glucose levels are monitored. So uh, that was about uh, glucose monitoring. So uh, do we do HVA1C? Uh, yes, in pre-existing diabetes at the booking appointment, we do. Uh, they recommend uh, HbA1c monitoring. However, uh, they do not uh, offer uh, to measure HbA1c at second and third, third trimester. However, it can be considered. Uh, they do not repeatedly recommend HbA1c level to assess the women's blood glucose control in second and third trimesters. So that was about HbA1c, and there's something called uh, intermittent scan CGM or continuous uh, glucose monitoring. The right-hand corner uh, picture shows a continuous glucose monitoring where in antenatal period, it has been attached to the maternal abdomen and it continuously monitors uh, the glucose in the patients and hence insulin uh, doses are adjusted uh, according to their glucose levels. When this is cumbersome, we can use intermittently scanned CGM. That is, when there are signs of hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia, it, the glucose can be measured and insulin is being adjusted. So when do we use all this? Is uh, We use CGM, that is continuous uh, glucose monitoring in type 1 diabetes mellitus uh, to help them meet their pregnancy blood glucose targets and improve neonatal outcomes. Intermittently scanned, uh, we use when the uh, patient prefers uh, intermittently scanned over CGM. So when there is a problematic severe hypoglycemia or unstable blood glucose levels in patients who are other than type 1 diabetes mellitus, this uh, CGM can also be considered. So we uh, meet uh, many patients where they can have a severe hypoglycemia. So this CGM helps them in maintaining glucose. Uh, so that was about the antenatal uh, monitoring. So going on to intrapartum. So why do we have to monitor glucose intrapartum? That is because of the risk of fetal acidemia and neonatal hypoglycemia in the uh, intrapartum period when they are exposed to hyperglycemia. However, insulin requirements decrease during labor because of less caloric intake and because of the uterine contractions uh, and the work of labor, the patient needs extra energy. So the universal recommendation here is to measure uh, uh, glucose levels every two hours in latent phase and hourly in active phase. So in uh, pre-gestational diabetes mellitus, latent phase, uh, we measure CBG every two to four hours and in active phase, every hour we uh, should measure. In case of GDM, GDM on diet or uh, maternal nutrition therapy, when the patient has optimal control, in latent phase, we can measure before and after meals. But if the patient is not taking anything or uh, she's not eating, there's no oral intake, then we have to measure every four to six hours. So this monitoring can also be decreased if they have a stable glucose levels, which is normal consistently. So these are the recommendations. However, intrapartum, uh, when they have GDM on OHA or uh, insulin, they require insulin and OHA. Uh, we have to uh, increase the insulin dose to maintain euglycemia. These are the various recommendations uh, for blood glucose target during labor, uh, different guidelines. So we have to maintain glucose between 70 to 126 mg per deciliter. So RCOG also recommends intrapartum every hour monitoring in labor and birth. So that was about intrapartum monitoring. Now post delivery, do we have to follow up? Yes, definitely because of high risk of uh, developing type 2 diabetes mellitus. So this is the recommendation by the NHM. Uh, 75 grams OGDT, that is fasting and a 2 hours uh, postprandial at 6 weeks postpartum to evaluate the glycemic status. So here fasting should be less than 126 and 2 hours is considered normal when it is less than 140. It is impaired glucose tolerance when it is between 140 to 199 and diabetes as we all know more than 200. So when they test normal at six weeks, the women is counseled about lifestyle modifications, weight monitoring, and exercise. And the patient is advised to get annual screening for diabetes mellitus in the NCD clinic as per uh, their protocol. So when they test positive, uh, this is when they test normal. So when they test positive or impact glucose tolerance is being diagnosed, women should be linked to the NCD program. Here, our GDM is always a part of NCD program. So, do we recommend breastfeeding? Yes, we do recommend uh, breastfeeding to all patients. But pertaining to GDM, what happens? Uh, the uh, breastfeeding increases maternal glucose metabolism, 
and hence the decrease is the glucose levels. So there are several prospective studies show, which shows breastfeeding reduces long-term incidence of type 2 diabetes mellitus. And uh, type 1 diabetes mellitus, uh, we have to measure uh, glucose 4 to 6 hourly for the first uh, one to two days, that is 20, uh, 24 to 48 hours post-operative or postnatal in type 2 diabetes, fasting, pre-meal and postprandial uh, sugars needs to be measured. But in case of GDM, a fasting glucose at around 22, 24 to 72 hours after delivery is recommended to identify over diabetes. Then these patients are then screened at six weeks uh, or either uh, four to 12 weeks when they miss it. So that was about antenatal, intrapartum and uh, postnatal follow-up of patients who are getting treated with uh, glucose, uh, I'm sorry, uh, OHA or insulin uh, and how to monitor them. So moving on to how to monitor fetal growth. So in case of glucose monitoring, they had several guidelines, our national guidelines, universal guidelines and uh, various other guidelines. But in case of fetal growth, we don't have such uh, guidelines to be followed. But uh, why? Because there was no randomized control trials to uh, tell us how to monitor fetal growth in either uh, gestational diabetes mellitus or type 1 or type 2. And there were several uh, obs uh, observational studies, but in those studies, there were no fetal loss, so no conclusion could be attained. There were several cohort and case control studies which included fetal loss, but they were all inconclusive. So, uh, monitoring this fetal growth practice, uh, this varies by institution to institution and every practice setting differs. So, but everybody has common, does a single, at least a single third trimester ultrasound at uh, 36 to 39 weeks, regardless of their metabolic control. So, various par uh, practice patterns have been identified. Uh, some of them do an ultrasound early in third trimester to uh, make it a sign of a suboptimal uh, glycemic control and decision for induction of labor is being made. Some do serial ultrasound every four weeks from diagnosis till birth. Uh, to identify macrosomia and a few do not recommend monitoring in case of uh, when the, the glucose is being uh, treated with either diet or medical nutritional therapy because of false positive findings which leads to hydrogenic complications that is they have uh, seen an increased LSES rate so what our rec uh, NHM recommends is when uh, uh, sugar elevated sugars have been uh, diagnosed, diagnosed before 20 weeks then an anatomical survey at 18 to 20 weeks need to be carried out. In case of GDM, they recommend a growth scan, that is biometry and an AFI at 28 to 30 weeks and at 34 to 36 weeks. At least a gap of three weeks should be there. Uh, so in GDM, which is being controlled uh, by uh, diet or uh, MNT, so AN visits should be planned as per high-risk pregnancy protocol or according to the physician. These should be, the patients should be seen at least once monthly. When the GDM uh, with uncontrolled sugars are there or with, uh, associated with any other complications of pregnancy, we, uh, they will have to refer to a higher facility and AN visits as per their protocol. So what the guidelines suggest is uh, GDM monitored, I mean, uh, controlled with diet alone. AFI is uh, recommended. When there's a uh, GDM, uh, which is being treated with uh, OHA or insulin, when this GDM which uncontrolled or uh, suboptimal control of sugars are there or any complications of pregnancy, then they all recommend an NSC and AFI at least twice weekly for from 32 weeks. So this is what they recommend. And this is a general approach to obstetric patients of uh, uncomplicated GDM. This is the same as we discussed before. So all recommend uh, an ultrasound uh, uh, to determine the fetal weight at uh, 36 to 39 weeks when it is more than uh, 4 uh, kg or 4.5 kg schedule cesarean is being carried out otherwise NSC and AFI at uh, uh, beginning from 32 weeks. So every time a patient visits uh, the antenatal care center we have to monitor an abnormal fetal growth that is macrosomia or an IUGR or polyhydranios. A and steroids, we'll, uh, I'll uh, deal with it uh, later. Every visit effect should be monitored uh, by auscultation and patients should be advised about daily fetal activity assessment. Uh, RCOG recommends uh, fetal growth and amniotic fluid volume to be measured every four weeks from 28 to 36 weeks. And uh, they uh, advise an individualized approach to monitoring fetal growth. 
So uh, we'll move on to, uh, that was about the PD growth. We'll move on to management of selected antenatal patients. That is any uh, patient which, who's been uh, uh, given antenatal steroids, either for uh, GSGN or preeclampsia or preterm labor, we'll have to monitor sugars. Why? Because of its hyperglycemic effects, as we all know, beginning from 12 hours from the first dose, lasting up to uh, five days approximately. So frequent monitoring of CBG is required at least four times a day. Uh, more frequently, depending on the glucose levels, beginning, beginning from 12 hours after the first dose and 24 hours after the second dose. Then after with control with insulin or anything, then we can reduce the frequency to four times per day. So here when FBS is more than uh, 100 and PPBS is more than 140, we treat with subcutaneous insulin. So uh, that was about antenatal corticosteroids. Uh, in case of uh, preterm labor, we finished about antenatal corticosteroids. Uh, all of us give nifedipine as uh, first line management for uh, tocolysis. But when this nifedipine is contraindicated, most of us use terbutaline, which can be given. Uh, but mineral glucose needs to be monitored uh, when uh, terbutaline is given as beta ganagonus can increase sugar levels. So that was about uh, antenatal steroids and uh, fetal growth. In case of macrosomia, shoulder dystocia as uh, identified uh, in the ANC visit or ultrasound, uh, either IOL, expected management, or scheduled cesarean should be carried out. Uh, in case of any elective LSAs which we are posting or emergency LSAs we are taking up, uh, when the operation exceeds for more than one hour, we need to monitor CBG. So what the take-home message from uh, my talk is, Monitoring glucose in antenatal period, intrapartum period, and postnatal period, including the fetal surveillance and fetal growth, needs to be assessed uh, to prevent short-term and long-term outcomes for the in the uh, pregnant women and neonatal uh, outcomes. Uh, thank you, Oxy, for this uh, great opportunity. I thank everyone. Thank you. Happy birthday wishes to your daughter Rachana and uh, she is uh, sharing her birthday with a great personality like uh, uh, Professor Sheshaya. Uh, ha hearty wishes to her. Thanks Thank for being you. with us today in spite of your daughter's birthday. Thank you, Rachana. Okay, carry on. Rachana, it's a nice presentation and everybody. I don't find any questions in the chat box actually. Anjalakshi Madam has joined, I think. Madam? Please, madam has joined. Let ah. me share the screen, madam. No? Yeah. Lana has been introduced. I'm happy to welcome Dr. Anjalakshi, madam, to chair this session. She's a senior mm. consultant in uh, uh, obstetrician gynecology. She's the founder president of Tena Foji. And she, is the, she was the first president of Oxy, governing council member, DIPSI. Actually, that is more important because she was one of the person who was actively participated during the DIPSI research. And she has been associated with Professor Sesia, whose birthday falls today. And uh, on, um, Madam has done her research mainly in uh, diabetes uh, in pregnancy was her thesis. Right. So, Madam is a retired professor from Madras Medical College, retired professor from uh, now she's working in Mada Medical College. She has presented various papers in national and international conferences. She had original uh, work on single test procedure, the uh, DIPSI test, the diagnosis of GDM, and followed in guidelines of Government of India, has been, which has been endorsed by WHO and FICO. So she has her main research work is on DIPSI. So Oxy Institute, Dr. Anjalakshi Sandra said, award for best original research paper of the year. Madam, we are very happy to be, uh, you are busy, you are with another paper. Webinar. I'm happy that you are able to join this uh, webinar today for the second part of the thing on panel discussion. Welcome, Ms. Madam, to chair the session. A small correction, Madam. Dr. Anjalakshi, Madam, Institute that uh, award, not Oxy. <coughs> and my spelling, watch my spelling. Okay. Thank you, Prem Lata. I'm very happy to introduce uh, Dr. Danilakshmi, who is going to moderate this panel on gestational diabetes mellitus.
Good evening, moderator. I am Dr. Saroja Veli Sami from Dindical. Hello. Yes, ma'am. What is it, madam? I'll just. Dana, you can introduce your panel. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I'll introduce, madam. Ah, yes. Thank you. Thank you for being with us today, madam. In spite of your busy schedule, uh, we wanted you to be here because it is a diabetic uh, CME, and so we thought like you, you are the fit person to be part of this program, madam. Thanks for being with us. And I am happy to introduce my panelist, uh, the young and energetic Dr. Kritika Manivannan, uh, who's uh, from uh, who's working in Navy uh, as a consultant in Sri Sai Karthik Hospitals right now. And uh, we have uh, uh, Dr. Mahalakshmi Saravanan, a STEM professor from uh, KMC Chennai. Uh, and then we have uh, uh, Dr. Radha Madhavi, who is a founder president of Tirunelveli OG Society, and uh, she's a member of ISAR and IMS. And uh, she's a practicing gynecologist since 1994 till date. And uh, she has conducted two annual conferences for Thirunamalai Medical College while she was there. And uh, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Saroja Velisami, who graduated from Madurai Medical College. And she's also a postgraduate from Madurai Medical everyone. College. And uh, madam? Good evening, I said. <laughs> good evening, good evening, ma'am. And uh, she's now consultant of Karthik Nursing Home. And she's got a passion for NDV, NDVH, like any other Madurai consultant, madam. And uh, only if they don't do, uh, I mean, when they do abdominal, we are a little uh, surprised. And uh, we have the last panelist for uh, this panel discussion, Dr. Sumati, uh, professor of IOG at uh, master trainer in uh, emergency obstetrics, specially trained in uh, colposcopy, areas of interest are cancer screening and social obstetrics. So let us, uh, since we are half an hour behind schedule, uh, let us. session right now. So let us, uh, actually this uh, session is uh, like a open uh, book session, this uh, particular panel discussion. You know, I already gave the answer sheets uh, through this uh, four speakers who spoke before this panel. So I'm going to give the questions through our uh, protagonist. I'll name this uh, uh, patient of ours, Shakti, uh, influenced by day before yesterday's Women's Day program. Okay, so we'll just uh, go through it. And uh, we all know the aim of uh, care in diabetes complicating pregnancies. Uh, we should have early diagnosis so that we get a near normal outcome. The outcome should not be different from a uh, non-diabetic uh, pregnancies. And uh, when uh, we meet uh, pre-gestational diabetics or uh, uh, previously gestational diabetic, uh, the preconceptual counseling should start uh, even before she becomes pregnant and optimize glucose level once she gets uh, pregnant and fetal surveillance and uh, uh, should be uh, in place and a planned delivery. It should be a planned delivery uh, so that we can avoid uh, uh, all these things will avoid uh, fetal and maternal complications, both short term and long term. And uh, so we all know gestational diabetes mellitus is an essential, uh, I would say, evil because uh, the baby has to get enough glucose. And for this, uh, the mother has to have insulin resistance through various uh, anti-insulin hormones secreted during pregnancy. But uh, there should be a balance also. This hyperglycemia, uh, which occurs during pregnancy because of anti-insulin, should be uh, nicely balanced by the uh, maternal pancreatic function. But when this fails, then the mother goes in for uh, GDM. So this is a basic uh, of a GDM and then uh, uh, definitions, uh, uh, you, you all are uh, familiar with the definitions. We all went through the previous four speakers. So pre-existing or pre-gestational diabetes is either uh, uh, type 1 or type 2, pre-existing uh, the pregnancy. Gestational is when you find uh, any glucose uh, abnormality, okay, any uh, intolerance uh, 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 recognized during uh, pregnancy. But of course, we have a small set of uh, uh, undiagnosed type 2 diabetes when we go by this definition. Uh, okay, that's why we do get some kind of uh, anomalies when we uh, name them as gestational diabetes, we find an anomalous baby. Probably these were uh, uh, type 1, I mean type 2 diabetes just instantly diagnosed by our uh, uh, sensitive test during uh, our screening protocol. So these were already uh, brought out well by Dr. Archana. Uh, what are the long-term and the short-term complications of the uh, mother, fetus, and the neonate and the offspring. And uh, uh, 
uh, I just came across this risk of autism and other adverse neuro neurodevelopmental outcomes uh, could also be uh, part of uh, 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 diabetic complications and could be because of the shared environmental and genetic uh, problems as well. And uh, so we heard this through Dr. Uh, uh, Sarita and uh, newer concepts. Uh, of course, there are so many um, Mm, what is uh, what is that uh, chromosomal abnormalities and uh, defective genes identified in the causation of GDM? So we are maybe at the end the research setting, Madam will be able to highlight on this and uh, uh, justification for screening. Screening for diabetes performed in pregnancy because identifying patients with diabetes followed by appropriate therapy can reduce fetal and maternal morbidities. This we have and we have understood clearly from our practice. So we can reduce macrosomia, shoulder dystocia, preeclampsia uh, up to 40% or even more. And, uh, uh, and we also must understand fasting hyperglycemia among Asian females is less compared to the non-Asian population. This is an American study. And uh, we all know about the pedestrian hypothesis, how the baby gets bigger. And uh, we also know about the recent uh, concept of epigenetic modification, which uh, 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 looks at the what the, the baby, which looks like a healthy infant at birth, how it becomes a pre-diabetic child and uh, becomes a, um, I mean, a type two diabetic at a much younger age. So these are because of the epigenetic modifications which uh, work hand in hand with the uh, population as well. And uh, these are transgenerational effects of GDM and how it affects in the baby in the long run, the offspring in the long run. And uh, Barker's hypothesis and thrifty genotype, uh, genotype hypothesis uh, explains uh, uh, how a uh, baby which, which can be born with low, low birth weight can become an adult cardiovascular disease uh, prone pa uh, patient. So with this short introduction to GDM in pregnancy, uh, I welcome the team to participate in this discussion. So I'll just leave the discussion. I'm not a moderator. Okay. So, case scenario one, uh, Mrs. Shakti, primary gravida, 26 years. She's a BSc bank employee, meaning to say like she can understand your counseling well. So, that's why I made her as a educated one and an employed one. Uh, BMI of 27 kg per meter square, little on the overweight uh, side. Two months of amenorrhea, uh, urine pregnancy test was done by her at home, it was positive. Complaints of severe vomiting and she also complains of irregular, she had irregular, irregular cycle just before uh, her pregnancy. She had uh, appendicectomy at 22 years of age, no history of diabetes in the past when she had uh, investigations done during the time, at the time of uh, getting employed into the bank, all her uh, investigations were normal, uh, but uh, the family history is disturbing. She had both parents diabetic on medications. Dating scan. Uh, at this two months of amenorrhea, confirmed that she was eight weeks pregnant and is corresponding. It's an intra uh, single live intra gestation set. Uh, Madam Sumati, Madam, would you prefer pre pregnancy counseling if she had come to you? She's educated, employed lady, 26 years, both parents diabetic, irregular cycles, little on the heavier side. Actually, we would not like to have a regular or mandated to have a pre-pregnancy counseling. But if she had come earlier, I would like to tell only about the lifestyle modification of reducing her weight. That's the only thing. Other than that, it is not mandated to have a pre-pregnancy counseling to reduce or keep the blood sugars or we don't have any studies to say that. Whatever, Most of the time, there are people who are coming for PCOS treatment, irregular cycles. Who had been like this. The only thing which we would like to say is to reduce the weight so that she has an optimal weight during her pregnancy. So that's right. the thing which would otherwise I would not like to have a counseling. One more thing about tell to tell her is to have that she's at a higher risk of developing a diabetes or gestational diabetes. So she should go for a regular screening. That education on the screening for uh, gestational diabetes is the one which would like to tell if she comes in the pre-pregnancy period. These are the two things which would like to say in the pre-pregnancy, but it's not mandatory. Many of them come in the first trimester like this and uh, they have a presentation. So it's not an abnormal presentation as far as the city is concerned. Whereas in the rural aspect, most of them are coming with pregnancy. So in such patients, we will not have an option. So this is what I could say. Uh, Kritika ma'am. What is your policy on screening for diabetes in pregnancy? Do you do, do it routinely, Dr. Kritika? 
ma'am we have to do it routinely we have to offer universal screening we people belong to asian indian ethnic origin we are at high risk of uh, developing diabetes so universal screening has to be offered also the incidence of uh, uh, type 1 diabetes over diabetes as well as gdm is higher in our indian population so universal screening has to be offered at the first visit also the women who develop diabetes or uh, uh, develop it a uh, uh, decade earlier when compared to that of the people in uh, western countries that is indian women develop a type 2 diabetes mellitus at an earlier age when compared to the western population uh, so, so many of the people may have undiagnosed uh, type 2 diabetes at the initial visit so it's always better to have a universal screening at the first visit itself we have to ask them to go for a uh, universal screening for uh, diabetes and also in this women is your patient shakti your patient shakti has come to me as a now with severe vomiting that is the main complaint Yes, ma'am. We can no, do a fasting blood glucose. Yes, but the madam has counselled her that she is uh, supposed to go for uh, diabetes screening because she is on the overweight side and she has got uh, both parents diabetic. So when will you like a, 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 a screening test to be done on her? She is only eight. Ma'am, the first initial visit only I want to get her uh, screening done. We, even if she is having severe vomiting, we can do a fasting blood glucose. In case of a fasting blood glucose. Of course, it's more than 126. She is a case of over diabetes mellitus. In case if it is between 93 and 126, uh, she is diagnosed having gestational diabetes mellitus. In case if her fasting blood sugar is less than uh, 92, again we can subject to her uh, to a oral glucose tolerance test between 24 and 28 weeks according to the IODPSG guidelines. Uh, Madam Mahalakshmi, would you like to differ? No, no, no. Mahalakshmi, I speak for you. Good evening, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, uh, compared to selective screening, we have to do universal screening, ma'am. For this patient with history of uh, uh, more vomiting, uh, in uh, diabetes actually there is a uh, excessive vomiting because of uh, gastropathy. So uh, she might be a, um, a candidate who is uh, uh, anticipating a gestational diabetes, and she has very strong family history of diabetes. So she comes under the high risk category, ma'am. So we have categorized like. Uh, um low risk uh, moderate risk and high risk depending upon the uh, recommendations from uh, many um, uh, scenarios so uh, i would uh, suggest uh, uh, six um, oral glucose tolerance test at the beginning even now and at 60 uh, may, maybe around 16 weeks ma'am because uh, fetal beta cells uh, uh, would uh, respond to the maternal hyperglycemia so i would like to do it around 16 weeks. and if it is uh, negative then i would like to repeat it at uh, 28 uh, 24 28 weeks and then at uh, 32 34 weeks okay so uh madam so sumati madam what is ideal gestation to do screening for diabetes what is the recommended uh, and what is the recommended method the ideal uh, gestation age is to do it around uh, 14 to 16 weeks as per the nhm guidelines because of the increased risk of vomiting and other things and abnormal results where we don't have a good interpretation results so what we say is to have a screening three times in the whole of the gestation age or the three whole of the pregnancy first is around 14 to 16 weeks second is around 24 to 28 weeks again as 30 34 weeks or to remember easily first trimester end of first trimester second trimester and third trimester each trimester they should have a screening test so idea is not to miss anybody Ah, yes that is the idea and uh, if it's in the early pregnancy like this scenario case if they are coming with vomiting and if you are going to do a oral glucose tolerance test at 75 grams it is not possible to interpret the results within 30 minutes if the vomit it is going to be a uh, defect so it is uh, for her you can just ask madam said you can just have a fasting and postprandial if you are want, wanting to do it you can do it because other things are normal so the screening ideally will be in each trimester and the method will be a uh, uh dipsy method where we have 75 grams of oral glucose taken with 200 ml what madam has told with the uh, lime added to, so that to prevent vomiting and after 5 minutes you take the um uh, blood um, two hours after two hours you just take the blood sample one more thing is especially if you are doing in the rural setup a patient should not be made to have other investigations walking about it. going having the urine culture done in some other places where we have an abnormal they should be seated in a place where they can have the blood sugar done after 2 hours you should not have abnormal values you should not miss it but uh, by having a 2 hour uh, blood glucose taken after 2 hours of having this glucose so yes. this is the one which is being followed very important, madam this rural people especially after taking glucose they go home do some work and then come back 
yes so kind of uh, uh, do an expenditure of the glucose taken so they have a false low value and then they end up with a, a high glucose uh, when abnormal gdt at 16 weeks or 24 weeks so, so that's, uh, that's uh, this one they should not miss and even in a government institute where in the hospitals they'll be asked to have an ultrasound done in the next block they'll go there walk and then come back and then you will not have a good interpretation so okay. they should have the blood glucose properly after 2 hours okay as per the hcog they say uh, when you do the counseling with regard to the patients high risk patients who are high risk for developing pdm it gives a uh, uh, i mean improved of uh, glycemic control and the patient is uh, will be able to take folate regularly and the uh, lower rate of adverse effects is what is in, uh, was given in the william um, will uh, decrease uh, pmmr and uh, congenital anomalies and is cost effective in the long run and uh, when it comes to risk assessment uh, uh, as uh, dr uh, Sarita said, uh, "All our patients, we are all of Irish origin, Indian origin. So all of us uh, will have uh, will have to undergo uh, glucose tolerance test. Whether you are following uh, DIPC or IADA PST, we will have to follow this. And uh, this patient has got two high risk factors: family history of diabetes, ethnicity being an Asian and Indian. So for no doubt, uh, there is no doubt in uh, recommending a uh, GTT for this patient. And uh, individuals apart from this, uh, what is listed by NICE guideline." Uh, we have uh, green. I mean, uh, up-to-date uh, guideline which uh, gives extra points, like personal history of impaired glucose tolerance. Should this patient had a uh, appendectomy? Suppose she had a little high sugars, but that time she was told only on diet, and uh, her HbA1c, which was uh, some institution do it as a routine at booking a visit uh, testing, and HbA was just more than 5.7, but less than 6.5 impaired uh, fasting glucose. Or uh, it's significant weight in early childhood, or between. Of course, she's a primary gravida. Suppose she had been a multi gravida and she had uh, gained excessive weight uh, be, uh, up to adulthood and in between pregnancies, or excess weight gain during the first uh, 24 weeks. All this will add on to the risk factors. And uh, if the patient had been at 40 years, or if the patient had had a setting of PCOS. Uh, in the past, uh, but just before uh, her pregnancy, uh, she had treatment for PCOS. All this will put her at a higher risk. These are the additional points given out by up to date, uh, apart from the nice guidelines. Because in Western countries, they do the screening uh, for only at risk patients, for high risk patients. Whereas in India, uh, we are forced to do for everybody because of uh, our ethnicity. And when to screen, all of you have brought out very well, as soon as early as possible. Uh, as um, uh, Dr. Mahalesh said, we do it at 16 weeks and then uh, follow it 14 to 16 weeks and then follow it up with uh, 24 to um, uh, 28 weeks. Um, whether whether to follow a DIPSI or uh, uh, the con conventional DIPSI or uh, ADAPC depends on the institution where you work in. But of course, uh, caution is not to use fasting plasma glucose alone or random blood glucose, HbA1c, glucose challenge test, or urine analysis for glucose. To assess the risk of developing gestational diabetes, this is a 2014 uh, recommendation in the DIPSI uh, handout. So we all know about the HAPO trial, and uh, uh, the conclusion was uh, in strong continuous association of maternal glucose level below those for diabetes increased both uh, birth weight and increased uh, C peptide level in the cord. So this uh, DIPSI method is uh, explained in detail by Archana. So we all will go in for a universal screening rather than looking at the uh, risk factors because we are a vulnerable ethnic group. So that alone is an enough indication for doing a universal screening for our patients. She stopped vomiting by 14 weeks. She could undergo GDT by then. Okay, so we did a GDT. And uh, how will you interpret a screening test result? If it is DIPSI, and if it is IATA PSG, Dr. Radha Madhavi. Professor, uh, good evening, madam. Thanks for this uh, opportunity. Now, all of us are following maximum DIPSI only. This uh, it is a boon to our whole country. We are following this, uh, like Sumati madam told, more than 140. We are di diagnosing them as uh, diabetic, and uh, we are uh, straight away diagnosing more than 180. We are diagnosing them as diabetic and uh, putting them as GDM. So we are going to name them as uh, uh, GDM if the sugar is more than 140, right? To our value is more than 140 milligram per stage. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, Dr. Saroja? Yes, madam. Uh, Am I, I audible? Is it routinely in your institute, madam? Yes, Dipsy only routinely we do. 
but okay. in this particular case when we suspect diabetes already existing diabetes we can go for iid psg test and the result is according to who when gtt is done in two step procedure 50 g glucose given if it is more than 140 we can go for 100 g gtt and if we give 100 g gtt then we'll measure the fasting level it should be more than 95 and 1 hour 180 2 hours more than 155 and 3 hours more than 140 if it is like that we can i declare that they are having diabetes mellitus this is the iid psg test according to who criteria um okay so uh, madam what you described is uh, uh, carpenter uh, uh, with the what he described is a carpenter question method of doing it when we did as a two step method a gcd followed by a gdd where we followed these uh, numbers we, I, we forcibly uh, forgot all these numbers to get this new yes, number sir. yes ma'am but straight away we can do dipsy test only advisable for everybody a universal screen but when there is a patient is an existing diabetic patient we have, can do hva1c also Okay, so we all know DIPSI as to the state of, test of time and it is a one step screening and diagnostic procedure, easy to perform besides being economical. So we all yes. should uh, uh, switch over to DIPSI and uh, uh, the FOXI has recognized it and it's a, in a few, it's a matter of years, few years before the entire CBO recognizes this as a feasible method, especially in, uh, in all, whether it's affordable or non-affordable is different. In all countries, this should be possible. And, Easily, uh, economical and uh, reliable also. Okay. Reliable, but economical and peaceful. Very accepted by patients because you will prick them only once, madam. Yes. And uh, the patients also I mean, uh, like it because you prick them once. And uh, this is the, and especially in uh, uh, when your uh, plasma um, uh, calibrated glucometer, you are using it and it is hardly painless. Painless. Okay, very painless procedure. And this is the three uh, numbers you have to remember, 92, 180 and 153 for a IAD PSC. WHO more or less follows the same uh, number, except that they give a range. Instead of a number, they give a range for each of the numbers and we stop using this nanogram oral GTD as a second step procedure following a, uh, abnormal GCD earlier days. When we joined as PGs, we are doing this uh, carpenter question method also. So as uh, we are discussing, there is no universally accepted standard regarding uh, screening for uh, or for diagnosis of GDM because in none of the Western literature talk about DIPSI at all right now. But I'm sure they will be talking about it in a few years' time. Madam, one thing about this patient, she has come to us and uh, high risk for diabetes. Uh, would HbA1c in addition to her uh, uh, one uh, screening be good enough? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma I do agree with her, madam. Yes, I have asked for additional testing uh, because of one of time I have. Uh, I will go for it. Sorry, I am going backwards. What are the other tests? Uh, routine and specific. Okay, so routine tests in this patient will be the routine which we do for every antenatal patient. Specific can be your HPA1C, even though we don't. Uh, yeah, in an institution like us, we do it as a routine in the first visit. But in a smaller setup, you can do it whenever there is a high risk drug. At least hp one c can be reserved for high risk patients. But otherwise, uh, there's no uh, point in doing it as a routine for all patients. So we have interpreted both DIPC and IADAPC and WHO, if at all you are following one thing. And uh, we'll go to the uh, why should we initiate treatment, whether they are uh, in the GDM range or uh, impaired glucose tolerance range. Now, why should we uh, treat them at all? What are the goals and benefits of treatment? If the sugar values is, say, 156, a tipsy value turned out to be 156 milligram percentage, and she comes back with the result. Uh, Sumati, madam? Yes, madam. She is, uh, now we just name her as a gestational diabetes. Now it is more than 140, you name her as a uh, gestational diabetes. Sometimes you have people who are 200. So you then you revert your diagnosis. Could be an over diabetic, which has not been missed. So if it is around uh, 120 to 1, 199, we just named as as gestational diabetes. Our goal is to have a uniform period of blood glucose level throughout the whole of the pregnancy around 120. That is what we wanted uh, after postprandial. We want it to be around 120. So to now she's having a blood glucose level of 156. Then she has got a risk for herself as well as for the baby. 
So that is for the baby. Now we are diagnosing in the first trimester. As the growth goes on, she might end up with the baby having a macrosomic baby or also having a baby who has complications intrapartum as well as postpartum. For the mother, she has got a risk herself because of the blood glucose level. And she can, in a long term, plan, become a type 2 diabetes. And also she has got the risk of developing a preeclampsia or urinary tract infection, a preterm labor, and all these are the risks. So we don't want all these risks. We want to have her a goal of having a uniform period of blood glucose level around 120 postprandial. This is the aim of it. So what do we do is for the first initial start, we would like to put them on a lifestyle modification or give them diet, exercise, and as the medical nutritional therapy with the dietitian is already dealt with. So what are the diet we have? If you have a team where you have a counseling together with a dietitian, diabetologist, multidisciplinary team in your hospital in the same setup, you can have it like that. If it is not so, you will have to refer to each places. Or you can give an advice if you are in a very rural setup and you don't have any anybody. So the what is the meal plan which we want it to be is, we want to have a medical nutritional therapy. We want to have a calorie depending upon the weight and other things. We have to advise her. A meal plan, it is easy to remember for anybody is to have a split meal so that she doesn't have high levels of blood glucose throughout the whole of her pregnancy. So what is it? You will have to avoid foods which will increase the blood glucose level suddenly, like high glycemic index, like, like what the madam said, that fruits, what are the things which you have to avoid, especially in our country. Plus the meal has to be split. Three meals and three snacks is what we advise. So that's split meal so that she doesn't have any periods of hyperglycemia throughout. And also most of the time we don't have episodes of hypoglycemia unless otherwise the patient has some problems of vomiting or she has some sickness where she's not taking. Otherwise, hypoglycemia is not a problem with gestational diabetes. Periods of hyperglycemia has to be avoided. A split meal is what is advised. And we'll have to tell them about the carbohydrates and also the fats, proteins to be included. Uh, I just saw the plate, which was uh, uh, self-explanatory, to have at least half the portion with fruits and vegetables, one half or one fourth with carbs and one fourth with proteins. It was self-explanatory. So that's how we can explain to the patient so that they can take it up. Yeah, some of the reps can take up this as a complimentary offer to us so that we can discuss <laughs> Patients with diabetes. Based on exercises, yeah. one more thing that uh, they have to go, uh, exercise is one which we can say. We should not ask them to go on an exercise or a walk in a fasting. Usually we advise them to go on a walk after a food. So that half an hour walking after food will prevent periods of hyperglycemia. Especially in the dinner, after dinner around 8 o'clock and then go for a walk for half an hour. Outside have some fresh air and come back. So this is how you can tell them and the practically do. Most of them it. Do it. it gives them private yeah. treatment with their husband also. Most yeah. of them are walking with their husbands after yeah. every job is done, 9 o'clock they start walking and come back by 9.30. That's what yes. my patrons uh, tell me also. And yeah. uh, Madam, I would like to add a few points. Yes, ma'am. Already, madam has enumerated all the implications of diabetes in the mother and the fetus. A few things I would like to add. The mother, there are chances that the mother can develop uh, polyhydramnios. And in case if uh, the uterus is over distended because of hydramnios and macrosomia, there are chances that the, the patient can land up in uh, PPH during labor. So these two things can happen uh, for the mother in case that the blood sugar is not properly controlled. And once GDM is diagnosed, as we told her blood sugar is more than 156, we are going to label her as a case of gestational diabetes mellitus and we are going to give her put her on a medical nutritional therapy we would advise her to do a four point blood sugar profile with fasting post breakfast post lunch and post dinner values and we are going to have targets for that fasting should be less than 96 and postprandial values two or postprandial values should be kept uh, below 120 milligrams uh, per deciliter. We have to uh, do this over a period of two weeks and after two, uh, she has to do uh, this four point blood sugar profile twice in a week and after uh, two weeks she'll be having four point uh, four total of uh, four uh, point blood sugar profile. If 50% of the values are deranged then we have to start her on insulin. Regarding diet ma'am like uh, for a women with an ideal pre-pregnancy body weight the total calorie should be 30 to 35 kilo calorie per kilogram of uh, body weight. In case if the woman is obese, we can reduce five kilocalories and we can make it 30 kilocalorie per kilogram. And when it comes for an underweight woman, we can add up five calories, making it uh, around uh, 35 to 40 kilocalories per kilogram. For a woman with an ideal body weight, this will come around 2000 to 2400 kilocalories, which we can uh, make it as uh, three, as Madam told, we can make it as uh, three major meals and three snacking options in between. And out of these three major meals and three uh, snacking options, 
10% should come in the breakfast because the insulin resistance is higher in the morning we can make only 10% of the total calorie requirement in the breakfast 30% should come in lunch and 30% should come for dinner and rest of the 10% we can divide it in snacks when it comes for the snack options like uh, we practice in a periphery place ma'am we don't have a separate dietitian for the patient so we'll give some options i just want to share all those options in case if time permits i would like to do that ma'am uh, for snack options we can tell the women to have uh, at around uh, she has to have her uh, breakfast at around 8 o'clock and lunch at 1 o'clock and dinner at 8 o'clock and she can have a, a mid morning snack at around 11 o'clock and uh, in the evening at around 4 to 5 she can have her second snacking option and bedtime she can have another snack coming for snacks we can tell her to have coffee or tea without sugar or she can have uh, buttermilk or she can have with soup or non with soup or else she can have a with salad or uh, she can have a fruit salad uh, if possible in the evening she can take a uh, so, uh, chats like sundal once in uh, twice in a week and um, uh, regarding bedtime snack she is supposed to have only one glass of milk that comes around 100 ml without sugar nothing else to be taken at bedtime and uh, regarding um, uh, breakfast options she can take her usual breakfast portion size is of utmost importance when it comes for lunch we can tell her to take a, uh, tell her to increase the amount of vegetables she take we can ask her to take a fiber rich uh, uh, vegetable daily during uh, lunch time we can ask her to have either green leaves or uh, plantain stem or beans or broad beans she can have any of these three vegetables in her lunch so that this fiber will decrease the blood glucose levels and it will um, uh, obviate the need uh, like it will reduce the need for insulin Uh, in future so she can have a fiber rich diet in the afternoon if she is going to have one glass of uh, one bowl of rice she is supposed to have three cups of vegetables she can have a uh, vegetable poriel kuta all those things she can have and she has to avoid root tuberous vegetables potatoes uh, and plantains all those things she has to avoid and uh, she can take uh, vegetables like bottle gourd rich gourd bitter gourd Uh, white radish white pumpkin all those things she can include her diet if in case if the patient is not having that much affordability we can ask her to take drumstick uh, drumstick leaves in her diet and um, this diabetic diet we should ask them to take more of uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids carbohydrate should be around 50% and uh, protein should be around uh, 20% and fat should be around 30% when it comes for the fat like we can ask them to have a uh, fish in, in case if they are non vegetarian they can have a uh, fish twice in their uh, uh, diet fish twice weekly in their diet so that that essential uh, fatty acids will be uh, delivered through their diet so fish they can take but uh, they are supposed to avoid uh, fish that is deeply fried in oil instead they can have uh, fish put in uh, fish uh, in their uh, columbo and all uh, so uh, it's better to have um, fish and they are supposed to take adequate protein which we can tell them they can have at least uh, two uh, egg whites in a day they can have two egg whites in a day when it comes for uh, channa dal all those things they contain equal amount of carbohydrates even though they contain protein they contain equal amount of carbohydrate so the portion control is very important in case they are going to take channa rajma or dal for a protein uh, intake ma'am thank you thank you prithika for the elaborate uh, uh, interpretation of diet modifications and uh, gdm but of course optimum uh, diet is still unclear because each of us has got a uh, i follow my own diet pattern and uh, uh, everyone has their own diet pattern as per our patient needs and uh, depends on whether they are uh, chapati eaters or rice eaters whether they Uh, they are uh, slightly on the western food eaters so depending on that you have to modify so, your uh, diet uh, requirement for them and uh, uh, so uh, see we cannot say all this percentages to the patient so all we have to do is uh, everything was everything was especially strong. covered by the dietitian everything was covered by dietitian this uh, time is very short yes yes okay and uh, split that she covered everything dietitian she covered everything shiny surendra okay yes. thank you uh, split uh, breakfast in uh, two hours gap speaking of plasma glucose is why with breakfast suppose you used to taking four it is take two idlis at 8 o'clock and two idlis at 10 o'clock and uh, uh, meal plan uh, this is a simple meal plan which uh, contributes to 2200 calories and uh, on the left side is 1800 kilo calories and uh, exercise of course 30 to 60 minutes of walking or uh, on most days of the week so that is five times a day i mean five times a week and uh, um there are this is an investigation of risk reduction measures like taking metformin probiotics and the myo inositol even though we need a large uh, multi center trial uh, to advocate this uh, for our patients okay so this is this comes under diabetes prevention program they have started introducing metformin uh, for reducing the incidence of uh, gdm in um, uh, prone patients sugar prone patients and of course we already talked about hpa1c by dr uh, archana and uh, when will you add drugs along with meal plan dr radha madhavan 
So uh, we all talked about um, uh, diet and exercises. So we given her full two weeks. She yes. had one milligram percentage on uh, Dipsy test. Yes, when it is not getting control with diet alone, uh, we want to get it back to less than one forty. As ma'am told, ninety-five and one twenty. One twenty is very ideal. But uh, when she's vomiting, we cannot be very strict with her. But at least we should bring it back less than one forty. So we we'll add drugs because this lady's BMI was twenty-seven. I would add metformin to her because little higher BMI, their uh, metformin is, is very effective. Uh, Dr. Mahalakshmi, would you how would you counsel her uh, when the patient is on meal plan or drugs? How will you counsel her for glucose monitoring? This is another important one, right? So on one hand, you are asking her to take uh, insulin. Uh, that is one prick, and on the other hand, you are asking her to take uh, six pricks a day or four pricks a day. So, how will you counsel her regarding glucose monitoring? This is very, very essential when you put her on uh, either uh, oral hypoglycemic agents or insulin. Dr. Mahalakshmi, when she yes, ma'am, when she is on insulin, ma'am, as uh, Dr. Trithika told, uh, out of seven values, I mean, uh, uh, Over the week, we monitor the fasting sugars. So, out of uh, seven values of fasting sugars, if at least four uh, values are more than ninety, more than ninety milligrams per deciliter, we have to start insulin, ma'am. And again, if uh, or else, at least postprandial sugars, at least uh, majority of the postprandial sugars, if it is more than one twenty, we do start insulin, ma'am. So this is how we monitor. And coming to the monitoring of glycemic control, the success of the patient depends upon the uh, glycemic control. So the MNT uh, we have uh, following it for two weeks, and insulin is started if it is not controlled. Once the target blood glucose is achieved, that is women with the GDM till twenty eight weeks of gestation age, we can monitor once in a month with FBS and PPBS. So it is only in case of uh, when the target blood glucose is achieved. So after twenty eight weeks, uh, once in two weeks, or maybe more frequent according to the blood glucose levels. And okay. after thirty two weeks, it is once in a week till delivery. So in high risk pregnancies, uh, the frequency of monitoring may be intensified, ma'am. So this is how uh, uh, we monitor, ma'am. So once the blood glucose is achieved, it is up to ten uh, twenty eight weeks, once in a month. Then uh, after twenty eight weeks, uh, twice in a week. And uh, after twenty eight weeks, thirty uh, two weeks till delivery. Every week, Hello? we have to monitor the blood glucose. So, uh, maybe for growth, the baby is having increased abdominal circumference. You can still start her on uh, insulin, or the patient has got initial high blood glucose, uh, as Dr. Sumati Madam uh, pointed out. When the sugar level is really high, along with the uh, MNT, you can start them on OH or insulin. Suppose the sugar values is two hundred. On a regular dipsy testing, you can't give them a. Uh, you lose the opportunity of even that one week, two weeks. You can put them on. You can admit them. Uh, do the six values or four value sugars as per institutional protocol, and start them on uh, insulin as well. Uh, making sure that it is not a false positive uh, result that you got in uh, dipsy. So glucose monitoring. This is the chart which we follow in my unit. And uh, the frequency will depend on whether you are dealing with the GDM uh, on MNT, whether you are uh, dealing with the patient on GDM with insulin or OHA. So, but our idea is to make the fasting uh, level at uh, maintain at ninety uh, point and postprandial at one twenty. So, this avoids a lot of problems like uh, uh, large for gestational age and uh, with that which might lead to CPD or short dystocia in labor. Uh, continuous glucose monitoring, uh, okay, it is ideal, but then. Uh, Uh, we uh, many of them many of our patients may not be able to afford it so we can uh, have a target uh, uh, fasting at 95 and uh, pp at 120 at 2 hours one hour is better actually they say one hour of uh, pp is better because uh, we don't lose the patient uh, while you are waiting for this one hour sample to come in okay so that way it is better and uh, whether you are going to use insulin metformin glyburide all that will depend on uh, your institutional preferences and dr sheila elaborated on all these drugs So we'll not go into detail. And uh, the one the disturbing thing about uh, all these ages, especially insulin, is your uh, hypoglycemia pregnancy, with, especially which occurs in the uh, early mornings. So the patient should be instructed to identify the symptoms of hypoglycemia and uh, take a glucose-rich uh, food immediately, say one or two spoons of sugar, and recheck the blood glucose 15-30 minutes later. And if it occurs for more than once in uh, 24 hours time, it is time she gets admitted for evaluation, and probably insulin needs to be adjusted accordingly. Now, monitoring fetal growth. It was elaborated by Dr. 
uh, Archana, but still, uh, Dr. Saroja, you can elaborate on that as well. So, what are the problems you are anticipating while you are subjecting the baby, I mean, fetus for uh, monitoring? You asked from the first trimester, madam. Even the first trimester, GDM can cause congenital anomalies and uh, abortions, both macrosomia and IUGR in third trimester. Uh, the number of anomalies, number of anomalies, see, both in CVS and CNS anomalies will be there. We have to screen them for TIPA scan and cardiopetal echo also. TIPA scan for CNS anomalies and CVS anomalies, both VSD and greater transposition of the greater vessels may occur. CNS anomalies, anandkapali, spina bifida, all can occur. And IUG uh, are also super added, uh, super high, high pregnancy hypertension added, IUG uh, can occur, and macrosomia can also be obtained, uh, occur in gestational diabetes mellitus. Any yeah. other thing is? Yeah, usually congenital anomalies, whatever we find in GDM, may be because of the underlying uh, uh, type 2 diabetes. Uh, which was very serious anomalies. Otherwise, uh, GDM has been proven not to contribute towards congenital anomalies, and uh, uh, so we assumed that the patient is already not controlled. Uh, and it is uh, not controlled. And hypoglycemia may also cause congenital anomalies. Madam, that occurs only very early, madam. We have already taken this patient to 16 weeks. Madam. Are you drink fetal death? Okay. Uh, IFP, yes, madam. IFP is a um, other uh, big disturbing factor for all of us. And uh, we have to uh, do a twice weekly NST plus modified biopsical profile starting from 32 weeks onwards. This patient we should be uh, we should be under a close watch. And uh, fetal evaluation we already was elaborated by Dr. Archana. Uh, USG at uh, 20 weeks for anomaly scan echo can be offered, especially for patients uh, with the uh, type two diabetes or a pre gestational diabetes who have become pregnant and uh, uh, fetal growth and uh, life curve from 32 weeks onwards. Uh, when your institution can, uh, when the, uh, the it's uh, started a little earlier when the patient also has developed a PIH. Uh, this is uh, DC guidelines, fetal uh, HPA once I mean abdominal circumference and DFMC from 20 weeks onwards and uh, FTS especially you know that is the first time so screening for a patient with pre gestational diabetes. And uh, steroids, we elaborated on steroids, how to monitor the patient while the, we are giving steroids for a patient. Make sure that the uh, sugars are well under control for five days. She should be monitored very closely. And you might have to give one or two dose of uh, plain insulin to counteract the uh, excursions in the sugar values. And uh, after two or three days, you can uh, uh, bring it down to uh, four times a day. Initially, it should be monitored very closely. Generally, we wait. Sometimes we may not have waiting time. In that case, we give... Uh, steroids and we also uh, make sure that the uh, increase in sugars are taken care of by additional insulin. And uh, when will you plan delivery, madam? Uh, madam? Madam, uh, I prefer 38 weeks. That is the time. I will uh, prefer either vaginal or abdominal depending on many factors. But 38 weeks is the maximum I will allow them to go, madam. Yeah. I never go beyond 38 weeks because I have once bitten twice shy about diabetes. Yeah, even though all the books recommend us 39 weeks, even all of us are a little worried when a patient crosses 38 weeks. Uh, of course, depends on so many other factors as well. And uh, how do you conduct delivery? Or would you be, can it can it be conducted in a smaller setup? Usually, uh, yeah. It uh, should be uh, an institutional delivery. Possible. Madam, it's a high risk. You, know, you always try to go into an institution. Usually, um, in uh, though we have uh, deliveries occurring throughout Tamil Nadu, if you have a high risk identified, that should go to a place where they have a facility for a cesarean Make section. Two. So Make it should be in a sleep home center yes. where they have facility for obstetrician, anesthetist, and pediatrician together. Yes. So it, that yes. is the place where they are supposed to go. Yes. They are totally under control on MNT alone throughout pregnancy. When the patient is especially on OH or insulin, it's better to uh, deliver these patients in an institution setup. And of course, there are indications for electro section. Um, we all know. Obstetric uh, indication. Obstetric indications. And the patient indication baby is macrosomic more than 4.5 kg. In our setup, even 3.5 kg plus, you should have a suspicion of a macrosomic baby. And uh, you can ask for a detailed ultrasound even at 13 weeks before deciding on uh, giving a induction or uh, taking out of an electro section. Okay, if the shoulder. Uh, circumference is a little higher then you can uh, kind of prime the patient that uh, she might go in for a emergency section during the course of labor 
okay and uh, we should be able to monitor the uh, sugar during labor intranatal and postnatal also yeah induction of labor is got its advantages you can avoid a late stillbirth as uh, radha madam said little worried uh, we, we do not wait till 40 weeks we start uh, worrying about the patient from 38 weeks onwards and uh, disadvantage is risk of induction with a failure with its own failure rate of almost 16% and increased tendency would be just because we induced her no like you know, the relatives become uh, restless and after the patient is in the labor room for more than 12 hours and uh, she is not at delivered and all that and uh, uh, glycemic monitoring during labor and uh, delivery had been elaborated by dr archana of course uh, uh, we generally do not uh, i don't know how many of you have got the habit of starting a insulin drip do you go by insulin drip or go by Uh, uh, two hours BPP. Two. I mean, uh, I intermittent uh, monitoring, not a trip. Every two hours monitoring or every one hour monitoring, depending on her uh, previous uh, glycemic uh, levels. Latent, latent phase. Insulin, insulin high dose of OHA. This kind of patients, I'll go in for a hourly monitoring and can give tightening dose of uh, uh, short-acting insulin. Most of the patients may not require insulin at all. Uh, it's just uh, low cases. They'll be starving and. Uh, most of the energy is exp- i mean uh, is uh, uh, put on uh, labor okay the contraction the uterus take up uh, most of the energy sources and uh, so this is uh, what we call the rotating fluids protocol and interpartum uh, glycemic management like for every uh, point you can see here uh, for 120 no uh, insulin is required if it is between 120 to 140 one unit of insulin 140 to 160 two units So one hundred and sixty to one hundred and eighty three units and one hundred and eighty two hundred four units. So it's almost like titrating dose of insulin, which we follow for uh, uh, our post-op patients, uh, gynec patients who are on uh, insulin or uh, OHA. Uh, the same kind of uh, this one. Only thing is the number varies. That's it. And uh, uh, the neonatal hypoglycemia. How do you identify neonatal hypoglycemia? That is one big question. So you have to suspect uh, neonatal hypoglycemia. When the baby is having jitterness or tremors, the patient will typically say, "My uh, this." Okay, so tremors, episodes of cyanosis, convulsions. So convulsions tells you clearly that could be most of the time the uh, problem could be with the uh, glucose level in the baby when it's less than 35 milligram per cent. Intermittent napping spells or uh, tachypnea. Of course, these babies are observed in NICU for uh, 24 hours minimum. Okay, so. Uh, this also had to be counseled to the patient that the baby will be away from you for 24 hours for observation, and uh, the baby will have uh, difficulty in feeding, eye rolling. All this should be explained to the patient so that the patient can monitor it, and uh, where they can alert the baby doctor whenever such one of the ten symptoms occur on the baby. One point I would like to add, madam. Here I'll be more liberal in the usage of uh, formulas rather than waiting only for breastfeed. At least the first dose, no, I usually give. Formula feed. I don't want hypoglycemia and all hazards with the baby. Our baby doctors also do it, madam. But we, being an institution, we involve a baby doctor. Institution, doctors. we have milk banking, no, ma'am. So institutions have milk banks uh, facilities. <laughs> so that is also there in private. Uh, better than institutions, we have milk bank. So some breast milk, we don't go, go some, out of it. Some of the other mothers in the NIC who come to NIC who are uh, Uh, magnanimous enough to spare their uh, breast milk, madam, at times, and uh, depends on uh, how you counsel the mother. Of course, we don't start. Uh, uh, I have n- never written a prescription for formula feeds, being an institution. What is I have stored once for just for one time. <laughs> and what are the uh, postnatal review? So most of the time, uh, uh, Dr. Mahalakshmi, can you take up this? How you do this postpartum review for this patient? Immediate um, postpartum, the patient. Immediate postpartum period, the gestational diabetic patient will revert back to normal. But already existent diabetic patient or patient developed in early trimester, they won't revert back to normal. Hence, we have to measure the blood sugar level and give them in the insulin in postnatal period also. And after four to six weeks, we can repeat the uh, the, the, uh, the screening of diabetes. And if it, they are found to be a type two diabetes mellitus, the patient should be explained about the risk of developing type two diabetes mellitus in later age, later stages. And we have to treat them accordingly. After four to six weeks, she has persistent diabetes. We can treat them with the insulin, or oral hypoglycemia can be switched over according to the advice of the physician. And after 
one year screening she is normal we can repeat the screen once in three years according to the who but we can repeat the screening every year this is the post mortem management when will you do this ogtt for this patients would you do ogtt dr mahalakshmi after after four, four to six weeks and uh, what is the current uh, uh, recommendation some of the uh, recommendations are to do it for data before you discharge uh, ma'am uh, before discharge patient uh, within one to three days of delivery uh, fasting blood glucose or random blood sugar should be done ma'am and before discharge fasting and postprandial should be done suppose if it's a post operative patient we can repeat after 48 hours uh, then um, suppose uh, then you have to repeat the og og tt 75 grams 2 hours in 3 uh, to 6 months of pregnancy then i mean a uh, postpartum sorry mom 3 to 6 months of postpartum then uh, repeat it uh, in the year end that is after after a year then repeat annually with the, uh, uh, fasting blood glucose alone mom then uh, annual this thing then suppose if it is planning for pregnancy then we have to do a pre pregnancy og tt with 75 grams So, our Shakti patient was put on uh, uh, metformin, five hundred milligram twice a day, and she had a two point seven kg BB. And uh, now she has uh, had a normal postpartum blood uh, sugar values, and uh, she is coming to you at six weeks. Repeat OG TT seventy five grams. Yeah. What about breastfeeding? I'm breastfeeding. My breastfeeding should and be given uh, immediately, at least four hours within uh, delivery, uh, to avoid. Uh, Uh, neonatal hypoglycemia as well as uh, breastfeeding has a, a role in uh, decreasing the uh, weight of the mother mom actually so that is also one of the the, the current practice of breastfeeding is breastfeeding on table when you are doing cesarean this side cesarean section clothing the cesarean uh, scar the uh, the, uh, the nurse is giving uh, i mean making yes. the baby feed from the mother okay and like the mother is very sick most of the babies feed on table For even for a cesarean uh, pregnancy and uh, cesarean delivery and for normal delivery, every day, normal day, twenty minutes yes. of this. Uh, as soon as the mother is comfortable, the baby is put to uh, breastfeeding, and uh, this patient should be counselled about uh, uh, the importance of breastfeeding, how it can reduce incidence of G type two diabetes in the long run, and uh, contraception. Contraception is another important thing. They can take any kind of contraception, but uh, what you would prefer, madam. Uh, The educated lady, madam. Contraception is the first one, madam. She is an educated lady. Progesterone only pills also is good, Anna. Yeah, six weeks she had done a OGD. It was normal. Okay. Anna, uh, it is uh, half an hour extra overtime, I think. So I don't know. Okay. Okay. So depression has to be taken care of. Okay. So postpartum testing uh, with the OGD at six weeks. and uh, because why they are saying like uh, no to ogdd in the immediate postpartum is breastfeeding will take away most of the calories so uh, in between the 2 hours if the patient has had a breastfeeding that will uh, give a falsely low value so that's why you wait for 6 weeks and 6 weeks is the time when the baby comes for immunization also so you can time your visit in such a way but if the patient is not able to do this ogdd alternative but substandard ones like uh, fbs and hba1c are allowed in some times and uh, postpartum interventions uh, you can have a life cycle this should be continued these are the patients who are at risk for developing type 2 diabetes later in their life so whatever you are initiated uh, in the good faith during pregnancy like a diet and uh, exercise should be continued in the postpartum period and uh, uh, i just give them allowance only for 6 months or one year till as long as they breastfeed and uh, once they stop breastfeeding they have to take care of themselves so that they are fit enough to take care of their offspring in the long run they shouldn't become a fully uh, fully blown diabetic at 40 years not able to take care of the children which they wanted very much okay so so uh, i don't think we have enough time to do this juvenile diabetic but uh, never just say like this people are more prone for developing anomalies so here the question of uh, uh, pre pregnancy like counseling as some madam said this is very very important so that you have hba1c level of below 5.7 fasting below 90 postprandial below 120 then you give a green signal and make sure that the uh, retinopathy and nephropathy ruled out within the last 3 months before giving a green signal of course they do uh, understand you are all your advices well because they have been going to different consultants throughout their life 
nutrition uh, and dietitian and uh, nephrologists and uh, uh, cardiologists everybody so this uh, i think can skip this anomalies are more common in this kind of uh, individuals uh, the, even though the classical anomaly is cardiac degradation we don't see them at all and uh, this is a small uh, uh, a bit i got it from the literature search when the hpa1c is more what all can happen to the pregnancy so reduction of hpa1c by 1% decreases the neurotic defect by almost 50% so it's worth when the patient uh, decreases from 6.5 to 5.5 you can say like your ntd risk is 50% especially if the patient had a previous ntd in a previous pregnancy okay for a patient who over diabetic or a type 1 diabetic so pre pregnancy counseling fetal and maternal issues all these as we discussed monitoring glucose and fetus becomes a much more bigger issue for these patients of course they are most of the time they very very compliant uh, than a gdm patient that's what i feel okay because they understand the issues very fully fully well so pregnancy is a diabetic and it unmasks many degrees of carbohydrate intolerance if the islet cell reserve is poor or insufficient carbohydrate intolerance is asymptomatic and if not treated increase the prenatal mortality and morbidity the screening early as 16 weeks is recommended screening should be universal and not dependent on risk factors everybody is at risk in india when screening should be repeated you found negative at 20 weeks and 32 weeks so as somati madam said it's a three time screening as per nhm guidelines and the simplest low cut off like a dipsy should be used strict control of blood sugar is necessary throughout pregnancy apart from insulin certain ohas have a place like a metformin glyburate we are not very very familiar but it's equally good drug a team approach is mandatory especially with the dietitian and a neonatology so that you can plan your delivery for the post in the 6 weeks uh, postpartum and uh, giving them appropriate uh, contraception is also uh, important and the secret of successful perinatal outcome in all pregnant diabetic patients lies more in the achievement of excellent blood glucose level than the means of achieving whether you are doing a diet whether you are giving exercise whether you are giving them uh, metformin glyburide or uh, the older insulin or the newer design insulin our idea is to have this number h in our mind 90 and 120 and uh, with this we will be able to bring out uh, 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 the obstetric obs outcome which are not different from a non diabetic population that's a goal and a diabetic mother should have the same outcome as a non diabetic mother as well thank you so much uh, for your your excellent participation all my uh, panelists contributed well to this uh, panel discussion and uh, i hope uh, we conveyed a lot of uh, 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 good uh, uh, points to the audience who have joined us uh, madam for concluding remarks i invite dr geeta lakshmi uh, dr lakshmi yes ma'am ma i'll have few minutes yes, uh, i just want to tell the summarize the points yes ma'am actually we have done the summary but i'll add on to that see every pregnancy is a diabetogenic because of the metabolic adaptations it is diabetogenic it is a stress on the pancreatic islet cells so if they don't produce sufficient insulin they can have a normal glucose tolerance this can occur at any period of pregnancy starting from the first trimester it can occur in the third trimester also so the dictum is you have to screen the patient or diagnose the patient with a single test procedure that is the our indian guideline so follow the indian guideline because indian problems have indian solutions okay so you do the dipsy test and it is ideal to do the test as soon as you diagnose pregnancy before 8 weeks before the fetal heart is formed because the cardiovascular malformations are the highest whenever there is hyperglycemia and that is the first one to occur so it is ideal to do the screen diagnostic test one step procedure before 8 weeks of pregnancy or as soon as the pregnancy is being diagnosed one and then do it at the end of the first trimester and if negative in the second if negative in the third because first trimester you get about 30% of the gd markers in the first trimester around 45 they occur in the second trimester remaining 10 to 15% is seen in the third trimester one the next thing is uh, the 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 baby you no know, baby should recognize the mother's uh, glycemia as normal so so the metabolic adaptation fasting blood glucose comes to about 65 to 76 and postprandial is around 110 to 126 
so when you are goal in therapy you have to bring down the fasting below 90 and postprandial below 120 throughout pregnancy which will avoid the pregnancy complications okay and next thing is and this control should be continued even during labor but the labor being an intensive exercise they usually do not require any insulin if people are getting insulin and otherwise they will have a normal blood sugar but it requires a monitoring because you have to keep the blood sugar around 100 to 120 throughout labor if it is not there then it can result in the fetal intrapartum fetal problems like sudden death shoulder, uh, shoulder dystocia of course because of the fatness you get and the postpartum they have to be followed up we are doing a study to do the postpartum follow up because number of patients they are not coming back once they deliver they just forget the obstetrician so we want to do it on the second or the third postnatal day in case of cesarean section once they receive the normal diet you can do that test in normal delivery you can do it on the second day but of course we have to produce evidences we are doing the study on that okay and uh, regarding the diagnostic criteria so it is the i told you the indian guidelines you have to follow you give 75 grams glucose in respect of the last meal that is whether they had a food or not you give 75 grams and estimate blood glucose after 2 hours it should be less than 140 so if it touches 140 and above then you have to label her as dgm that does not mean that she requires insulin 90% of the dgm people they get controlled with the diet alone so the diet plays an important role so we have to talk more on the diet and this year they have dgm awareness year they have come out with the the plate gdm plate meal plate so meal plate which says the half and quarter portions which i think discussed earlier okay and uh, the next thing is the long term follow up is very important to prevent the diabetes occurring in the mother as well as in the baby newborn baby because newborn baby can have obesity dyslipidemia early onset of igt and type 2 diabetes and so on cardiovascular problems so by following the same new medical nutrition therapy even after delivery we can prevent diabetes in the mother or postpone it and prevent diabetes in the offspring so uh, this will prevent the later ncds so the uh, dictum is focus on the fetus for the future so to prevent because now the ncds on the ncds especially women are affected very much and even at the age of 45 years they are developing um, cardiac problem stroke all those things so it will prevent the ncd if you focus on the fetus okay and another thing is one single test will save two lives so that is another saying one single te- test will save the two lives okay and uh, the, uh, the goal in therapy is fasting below 90 and postprandial below 120 like the pp you remember 120 by 80 so it should be less than 120 and less than 90 the other criteria that is other diagnostic criteria you should learn and keep it but for use in practice it is the indian guideline you have to follow thank you so much thank you ma'am thank you ma'am for your uh, good thank, thank you ma'am for well this uh, panel okay thank you thank you ma'am coming up the panel so nicely and uh, thanks to all my panelists and i request uh, dr geeta lakshmi our treasurer uh, to give the vote of thanks she is a registrar and senior consultant and uh, iso kgs and treasurer i mean uh, original research paper in gestation glucose insulin was published in the world journal of advanced healthcare research in january 2021 and presented various papers in national and international publication a special interest are in adult health programs and medical education over to you dr geeta lakshmi thank you dana for the kind words um, at the outset i would like to thank the almighty for uh, wonderful uh, cme uh, you, uh, no, almighty was behind us uh, for the cme the two on the 10th march which is celebrated as the national yeah. gestation diabetes uh, awareness day which is the birthday of dr v seshaya the legend of diabetology on behalf of oxy we all should wish him a very happy birthday and he is a padma shri awardee and father of dipsy yeah. he innovated the idea of single point testing of a pregnant woman for early detection of pregnant women 
for early detection of diabetes during pregnancy. And his message, as Anjalakshmi Madam said, is prevention of diabetes start from That's in it. utero, save two generations by protecting pregnant women. So with these few words, we have done a wonderful session on behalf of Oxy on this World Diabetes Day, uh, the birthday of Professor Dr. Seshaya. And uh, thanks yes. to our uh, president and uh, our honorary secretary, Dr. Danalakshmi, for conducting a very nice uh, CME. And we started with a prayer. Yes. Thanks to Dr. Kundavi Shankar. And thanks to our president yes. for chairing the first session, yes. which... Uh, which was on screening of diabetes in pregnancy by Dr. Sunita, and which was followed by the nutritive aspects by Mrs. Uh, Ms. Shiny, and the pharmacological mm -hmm. management was very well dealt by Dr. Sheila K. Pillai, and the monitoring of maternal glucose and fetal growth, which was very wonderfully done by Dr. Archana, the young oxygen, and uh, the next scientific session, I thank uh, Professor Dr. Anjalakshi Madam for chairing the session and uh, concluding the session also. And uh, thanks to our moderator, uh, Dr. Danlakshmi. It was a very good uh, uh, panel and um, my congratulations to you. And it was so elaborate and interesting, which I think was uh, uh, appreciated by all the delegates and with the wonderful panelist, uh, Dr. Sumati Surendran, Dr. Saroja Velusami, Dr. Radha Madhavi, Dr. Kirtika, and Dr. Mahalakshmi. So thanks to all the panelists and for the wonderful panel, which was moderated by Dr. Dana Lakshmi. Thanks to all the delegates who logged in, and I hope you all enjoyed this day, the 10th March, the World Gestational Diabetes Awareness Day. Thank you so much. And I thank uh, Dr. Chitrakala, who had been uh, behind this uh, Shield uh, being an academic partner for this particular session. And I invite all of you to join the, for the in person CME with IME on uh, 12th March Saturday at uh, Rajunda Palace near Aryapuram. And also for a very, very, very interesting session on C endometrium uh, uh, a CME with the uh, VS Hospitals uh, Cancer Hospital on 20th March Sunday at uh, Radisson Blue Edmore. Uh, kindly join and grace the occasion. I uh, welcome one and all the delegates who have joined here. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Dana, ma'am. Thank you, Prem Lata, ma'am. Thank you, Geeta. Thank you, thank uh, you. Thanks, Radha. Bye, thank Sumati. You. Sumati, madam. Thank Hello, you, madam. and thank, thank you. you. Thank Sumati, madam. Yeah, thank you, the, Radha. Nice thank you, Anjalakshi, madam. It was a very good conclusion. Thank you so much. Anjalakshi, madam. Dipsy is so useful to me very much. Thank you so much. <laughs>